the Fishing Gurus podcast. What are you like with hot food, Tobes? What am I like with hot food? Do you yeah. know what? I had an extra hot Nando's the other day. Any good? Yeah, it was hot. This <laughs> man, hot. this man, <laughs> asbestos stomach. No, it's not true. It was um, it was a warming curry. It was it was five different chilies ground down. Beef, it was just it was great. Well, you tried some, it right? Sure. No, but he does this thing, right? <laughs> so you can see up menu. I can see it last night on our way down here, right? Lovely curry house just outside Newark. Um, see it on the menu. Five chilies next to it. Says it's hot. Only order if you like hot food. And he does it loads. Every time I go for a curry, he does it. Puts it in front of him. Matt, would you like to try a bit of this? <laughs> Did not, you try some? Go I've on. seen how hot it is, Tom. I don't want to try it. <laughs> it's not that hot. I can it's not. See, I can see it's hot. <laughs> it's not. It was. He said to me, it's hot but tasty. And that's what the guy said. And that was the truth of the matter. And it left a pleasant tingling. When it came, went in and when it came out, and that's all you can ask from a curry. Isn't <laughs> Might it? have just died. The cord Might have just the, been it, wouldn't it? The corridor toilets are not the place to go at the moment. <laughs> I'll tell you. What curry was it? Did it actually have a name, or was it just yeah. the five chili? Curry? It was. I think it was a. Was it a Hyderabadi or something like that? Or Hyderabad bol something? Yeah. It sounded evil. Yeah, yeah. It, um, he said to me, "I, I don't like them too hot, Tobes. I can't have like a vindaloo. It, it, it wasn't as hot as that, but it was just." It's nice. Good, a good restaurant. Wasn't what, it? What's your favourite meal? You're big on food. What is your mm. very, very favourite one? One meal, one last meal. Oh my god, you've chucked this in. That's this isn't in the plan. We haven't planned this question, is <laughs> we? Get, get talking. To it's a big with. question for me. This. Go on. It could be. It could be <laughs> a uh, chicken tikka sarg dansak madras hot, which you know where we learnt that one from. Oh yeah. But I also love Italian food, and I do think you know Ooh. a good creamy tomato pasta with maybe a bit of chorizo in it. Mm, one of them yeah, see I'd have a bit of that yeah yeah that sounds yeah. good what about yeah. if what about your signature dish I mean I've had some cooking of yours over the years that's been fantastic but if you had to make you know you've got a nice lady coming mm. around romantic evening at Tom Scully's pad yeah, yeah and you had to make her a meal what's it gonna be well if you put it in that context I have to be careful because as you know I'm a messy eater so I've got to think what's not going to end up down the shirt because it yeah. never goes down well on the first day no spag it? bowl then no that's not happening no I, th I think it <laughs> perhaps would be a fairly dry pasta with some yeah, yeah. um yeah with a nice tomato chorizo you know a few red peppers bit of garlic I always like to put garlic in because I always think, you know, if it is a date situation, if you both mm. have garlic, it removes any exactly. any problems, doesn't it? Yeah. So. Mm. Mm. And what about dessert? Oh, sir. Well, <laughs> you hungry, Matt? <laughs> <laughs> we'll be after this one. We'll be after this one. Um, <laughs> Tom Scully, welcome to the Fishing Gurus podcast. Thank you very much. We've been saying that we're going to do one for quite a while, haven't we? Mm. Um, your name's been mentioned an awful, awful lot of times in um, the comment section. Mm -hmm. Been mentioned on previous shows. Well, that's, that's interesting. I'm surprised, given if people have been commenting, I'm surprised you've asked me because I can't imagine it was it was all good. But no, anyway, terrible. We need some controversy, so I hope you've got some in the bag for us today. But always, always fantastic, sir. Um, it's a bit of a weird one that we both sat here because the last time we were under the roof of a guru slash corder building, um, it was a weird situation. Wasn't it was it? a weird situation, wasn't it? It was interesting. We, um, well, I was, um. I was working for Match Fishing Magazine at the time, as you were. We were both working on Match Fishing, and I got a phone call um, from Adam Rooney to say, mm. would you would you be interested in coming down for an interview? You and Matt, so I remember I spoke to you, and it was, it was, it was, um, they were after some media people. They didn't really have a media department at that time, did they? 2017, there was, there was nobody there, was there? That's um, mad to think, innit? Yeah. Guru yeah. didn't have a media department. Um, and we went down and we sat, not in this building. I remember Adam showed us this building, didn't it? But mm. we sat um, in the old building in, in, in Basildon and we had a lovely chat. We went for a Nando's, didn't we? Um, and what followed was, was quite interesting, wasn't it, over the next few weeks? But the long and short of it was I didn't end up coming to work for Corda Guru and you did. And that meant you left Match Fishing Magazine. And Match Fishing Magazine at the time was having a, a tough time and they said to me, we can't afford to replace Matt. They said, you're going to have to do it all yourself. And I'd been plotting, as you know, for a while up to that point, starting my own business. I've got this idea that I could do it myself um, or a version of what DHP were doing myself to maybe suit the modern market. And uh, that was the catalyst, the fact that I'd be working on my own. I thought, I can't do two men's working and do it as well anyway. So that's a loser if I do that. I thought, you know what, I'll set up Catch More Media. And that was uh, 
when it started. You came down here, didn't you, to yeah. uh, work with Adam and the team, and I set up Catchmore. Quite a big leap at the time. Like when I hear you saying that back now, I mean, what were you then? 29, 30? Yeah, that sort of age, 30, I think. Yeah. And and what sort of situation were you in in terms of comfort? Like house, money, to make that leap, start your own business at that age. You, what hmm. position were you in? It was an interesting one. I mean, it, I wasn't that secure in, in terms of my position. Um, I was luckier than most, Matt, or not most, but you know, I was, I, I've always considered myself very lucky in that I've got a wonderful family. Um, and don't get me wrong, you know, we're, we're not a wealthy family, we've not got a lot of money or anything like that. But I knew that if it all fell on its bottom, I could go home. You know, I'd mm. just moved back to Sheffield, got a job and, and, and been all right, you know. But I had got a house in Daventry. I was living down there, as you know. You were living with me. Um, More of a tackle den than a house. It was great, wasn't it? Like yeah. a bachelor pad. Um, and so I got a mortgage to pay. And, you know, I didn't know it would work. But I, I was helped in a way because, obviously, things in the, in the magazine trade weren't easy, were they, at that time? So mm. there, was, there was always the possibility in the back of our minds that maybe DHP wouldn't be around that much longer anyway. So it was made easier by that. Um, and I've always been comfortable with the idea of a, a calculated risk you know I've always thought well if you think it's going to work you've got to try it because you don't know until you do do you and and that proved to be the case you know once I went for it with Catch More Media once you're in that position you've made that you've done the hardest part which is taking the step and all of a sudden you, you're there then and you can make decisions much more easily because what's logical just follows and and that's what happened it it, it, it was an easy once I got past that hard part and decided I was doing it, I was on the journey then, mm. and it seemed a lot easier, if that makes sense. What was the business plan? What was the concept of Catch More Media going to be? You talked about how it sort of fell off the back edge of the magazine um, scene. What was you going to do in this business to make your money? What was the concept of it? Well, the, 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 the truth is in those early days, I didn't know. That's why I went with the name Catch More Media, wide open. I thought I can do anything. If people want photos, I can take photos for them. If they want videos, I can make videos for them. Um, it was a broad church of, of possibilities. I mean, my skills as I saw them at that time were content creation, whether it's a written piece for a magazine, photos for a magazine. I had no experience really of making videos with a camera. We'd made some phone videos that had done quite well, haven't we, on Facebook and stuff, but... Very uh, informal, though. Very yeah, informal. By no means professional. Um, but the plus side was there wasn't much professional level out there in the industry either. So I felt that was my, my skills. What I had to do then was find out how I could use those skills to earn a living in the industry. Um, and in the early, early days, I mean, it, it ended up being um, working for several companies, making content for them to use on their channels, but also... Um, for smaller companies, I mean, to name a few at that time who, who, who were good early supporters, um, Opbox, uh, Colmic did a lot with me in the mm -hmm. early days, uh, Census, another one, you know. Um, it was making content that I could then promote on Catch More Media, which gave them a little bit of promotion uh, in that space because Catch More grew quite quickly. But I was really fortunate, mate, in that um, you, you being the biggest uh, one of these, a lot of people in the trade helped me. I was so flattered and honoured by the response I got from the trade. It you, was... You've always been very well connected in the trade, and I think it's a good example talking to you and people listening to you. It's not actually that much of a big industry, is it? No. Everyone knows everyone and what they do and what they're up to, and, and in quite a friendly manner, I always think, which mm. makes me feel really good about working within the trade. And when I hear you say that and you going into your own business and the support you get it's quite a warm gives everything a nice warm feeling about what we do doesn't it, it it's wonderful mate it, it really is um who were the other people who helped you um rick tyler at Ockbox. he rung me straight away um, i actually talked to rick about doing it um but you know we've been friends for a long time i sort of like to think i've helped him with the development of the, of the system and certainly the promotion of, the, of his You have, haven't you? No um, doubt. And he's helped me an awful lot along the way. He was straight away, you know, he can count on me um, for, for, for videos. Yeah, put me down for two, I think he said. Um, I think Neil Grantham at Lindo rung me fairly quickly after and said, you know, don't worry, uh, or anything, you know, I'll do some work with you, which he, he did in time. Um, Sarah at Tunnel Barn Farm, um, Mark Downs was fairly 
quickly on the phone. I've, I've got some work for you. You know, Darren Cox rung me and said, Garbley, you know, we, we'll need some stuff doing in time. Um, and other people as well who, who just sort of acted as, as, as mentors, really. Um, I know you wouldn't see yourself probably as that, but you were very much to me an important person to talk to about it all. And um, you gave me some great advice. And, and Tom Lane, you know, of, of Lanes of Coventry. Mm. Um, yeah, it, it, in them early days, I, I straight away was thinking, well, not straight away, but fairly quickly was thinking, well, you know, I don't know how much I earned them, but say it was a couple of grand a month or whatever. I thought, well, all of a sudden, I've got from freelance work half that money at least, or a bit more. Mm. All of a sudden then, you're a bit more at your ease because you're thinking, well, I might have to go without a few things for a few months, but I've got to start here. I'm not going to be skint. You know, I can I can build on this. Mm. Um, and that reassurance was massive, and that allowed me to go on and, and push on, really. Yeah, you'd got a base to start on mm. almost. You'd got a really friendly, good base that were willing to kick it off with you yes yeah. amazing and one thing i want to touch on you've talked about your skill set there the ability to have the contacts the ability to have the confidence to go and actually have a go at doing it in the first place but what about the more practical skills to generate the content because i know that you were never a videographer no you weren't trained to film and all of a sudden you start in this business i'm going to go and make the main part of my business is going to be making films for companies mm. how, how did you learn progress and manage that because videography in itself is a massive skill absolutely um i didn't realize i think when i took the leap how big a skill it was uh i was perhaps a bit too blase but i mean joe carass helped me an awful lot in the early days he as you know was making videos for dhp then um and and he helped me a lot with um getting set up and advice on what to buy and how to do it um and the truth was, David Orr had a saying which really stuck with me years ago about how he built the HP, and that was, employ anglers first. Anglers who can write, never writers who fish. You've got to get that bit right, i.e. if you've got the knowledge base, that's the first skill set almost, or the most important. So I sort of thought, well, at the end of the day, I know about fishing. I know, I'm lucky enough to know a lot of the biggest names in fishing through my job as editor of Match Fishing Magazine. I'll be able to get in touch with these people and, and create content that people want to watch. Now, it might not be the best shot content or the best edited content, but if you get a bad video of Bob Nudd talking about fishing to hand on the air, it's going to get loads of views. It's going to get more views than a perfectly shot video of somebody who no one knows fishing on the air. So if you get the content, it's still the same now, isn't it? Mm -hmm. You get the views. And, and I was confident that Working with that mindset, I'd be able to do that. And I should also say, I mentioned, obviously, the people in the trade who helped me early. Two people, Alan Scothorn and Bob Nudd, straight away were happy to work with me and make content. They never charged me a penny, Matt, which, you know, mm. I was really humbled by what, that. What a tool that is, to mm. have them two people, well, not even arguably, on paper, results speaking, probably the best two people ever in match fishing. Yeah. Five times world champion and a four times world champion saying to you, I'll come and do a film with you. Yeah. I'm not taking any money off you. Yeah. Let's go out. Yeah. And if you want to do more, we'll do more. And and, 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 and no problem, Tom. Good to help you. You know, and, and I, I was I was quite uh, touched, quite emotional about it the first time. I, I was driving back, I think, from one of the days with Alan and I thought, how lucky am I that this mm. man's, you know, given me this, this time of day. What, um, what's amazing, those films that you did five, six years ago with them anglers. People still talk to me about them now. Alan Scothorn slider fishing at Poolsbrook and on the mm. River Trent when he bowled the bloodworm in, in the ferry field at Burton Joyce. Like uh, Bob Nudd on the air. Mm. Like, people are still talking about them now, which shows that concept you have of content is king. Mm. The right people, the right venues. Don't really matter how they filmed. Yeah, yeah. It's, yeah obviously... You've got to try and get the filming as good as you can, and especially on the on the trade aspect. Um, and it, it it was now. Don't get me wrong. I've never been a leader in the industry in the in the quality of the work filming wise. I, I like to think I get a good standard by having good audio and nice nice camera angles, and and you know you can get a good level. But some of the stuff that you guys, for example, create um, or you know Preston Matrix, whatever, it is all singing, all dancing, high budget stuff, isn't it? It's fantastic. But you know. I hang my coat on the fact that I've got a lot of passion for fishing. And, and when I'm out with Bob, I genuinely really want to know how he fishes 
Mm. And, I re- and the same with Alan. And I hope that that comes through. It's not an act. It's not like I'm making a film for the sake of it. I want to know how, how Alan Scothorn fishes slider. And, mm. and so the fact that that's injected in there as well, hopefully comes through in the film that it's a genuine interaction between the camera or, or me behind the camera and the person. And, and the end result is more engaging than it might be if it was a, a product video, for example. Mm. Mm. Tom, can I ask you, mate, when, um, when it came to starting Catch More, mm. what did you have, um, you know, kit wise? Cause to make videos and, and stuff like, you know, requires a lot of kit. Did you, did you start with nothing or did you build over time? Well, I, um, I bought a couple of, uh, I can't remember what they were. I'd like to say D fifties, ninety Ds. Were they ninety Ds? Something like that. Yeah. yeah, yeah. They were a couple of. They were relatively cheap tobes compared to the kit we use now. Yeah, um, yeah. I think they were five or six hundred quid each. These cameras, two DSLRs, a couple of lenses, the cheaper Canon lenses, a macro yeah. lens and a wide angle. Yeah, but you still you there already. You still racked up a few grand. Surely. Oh, it was well. That would be about fifteen hundred quid. And what I did, and there's a funny story here actually. Um, I thought to myself, right, I want to. You know, this is uh, perhaps t- typical of me not thinking things through that well. But anyway, I thought to myself, right, I want to make a big impact in this now. I need, uh, it's all very well going out and doing videos. I want the wow factor. I want to be able to do something that people go, bloody hell, catch more media. That's what, what they're doing. <laughs> I know what I'll do. I'll do a drone course. So I booked on this drone course and did it and it was fine. Um, and I bought a drone. Anyway, I've gone online and I was like, all this, this particular drone was about, 1800 quid it was a dji phantom 4 i think it was yeah proper and, one and uh 1800 quid i thought right that's a lot of money let's have a look around let's have a look around i found this little website um i always remember weirdly enough it were called toby deals oh, that's what it was called never. it was it was called toby what deals. A chance yeah that was, that was my gig before this <laughs> <laughs> and uh anyway so and this this drone were about 1400 quid it was like loads cheaper you know four and five hundred quid i thought i'll order that <laughs> anyway I, I ordered it to DHP because I was obviously working there the day and, and I was doing my notice period at this point. And uh, I always remember thinking, it's not it's not here yet, this drone. Hmm. And then it went, well, another couple of weeks went by, it still wasn't here. So now it's three or four weeks after I've ordered it, it's not come. And I think I remember saying to you, Matt, I'm a bit worried about you it. You paid for it at this point. Yeah, I paid for it when I've ordered it. Yeah, oh, yeah, no. Not here. And I've Googled these Toby deals and there's just all these reviews, terrible reviews, like <laughs> product product missing, <laughs> product lost. No, not uh, ordered from China, not got my money back. It turns out it's a Chinese company that, that, that basically run the risk. I think they call it grey imports, don't they? Where they send direct from China to the person or no. whatever. And that's why it was cheaper. Anyway, all this time. And I'm honestly thinking, oh, no. <laughs> I, I'm just thinking that's 1500 quid off, whatever it was, gone. And then, lo and behold, it turned up. Never. <laughs> So I was like, Toby Deals are the most wonderful company. <laughs> they have all the good reviews, fantastic. But um, yeah, so I, I thought I'll, I'll, I'll do some drone um, footage. But basically that was it. I bought the cameras. I've got a GoPro already that you and I had bought to mm. do our, um, our our little bagging bros project that we yeah, did, didn't we? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> managed to film you falling in the canal on it. And oh, that God, that it. was funny, that one, eh? Um, but yeah, so I, I've got those. And, and uh, I think, it, I think you know, my early films, when I think back to them, um, Again, because I was feeling my way in, it was very much a story, so I don't really remember, but I did, I think the first one I ever did was with Nick Speed at Woodsborough, mm. and uh, we got a nice drone shot of it flying over the lake, and I wasn't the first to use drones in fishing, it was happening before, I think Corda were doing it, maybe one or two others, but I was probably certainly one of the first in match fishing to have those kind of shots, mm. um, and uh, and so yeah, um, that was what I had to, it was a drone. Uh, yeah, a GoPro and a couple of cameras. Not a lot. You know, when you think of setting up a, a business. Yeah. Like, I think I probably spent in round figures five grand, maybe a shade more, five or six grand. Um, and and that I got from, a lot of it was on um, interest-free credit. It paid a certain amount every month from mm. Jessup's, I think it was, the camera place. So it wasn't a massive startup when you think what you could start, spend to start set a business up, you know. Mm. Um, mm. And you know what? The wonderful thing about Canon was that they all kept its value. I remember selling them same cameras when I upgraded a couple of years later and I hadn't lost that much money on anything. So mm. um, it worked out all right in that sense. Were they, were they, cause like you, you're not a stressful person. I know that cause I'm good friends with you, but like, did you get stressed in them early days at all? Were there ever any like heavy worries or anything on you? Um, the only worries, like, I've never worried about, I never worried about it failing because I thought, I, I didn't think it would. I was quite sure it would work. 
in my, in, in my heart of hearts. Mm. After the, that early time when I got that bit of support from the trainer, I thought I can earn a bit of money anyway. The only stressful times I've had with it have been people-based stressful times when, for example, people haven't been happy with what I've done. And out of how many? Well, 400 and odd jobs, you could say up to now we catch more. That's only happened off the top of my head once. Wow. Um, I won't go into what it was, but it was um, basically a client who didn't know very much about what they were talking about, to be honest. And um, they were blatantly wrong. And once, I, once I'd got some reassurance on that, I was I was happy, you know. Um, yeah. You never sort of got down about any of it or worried or... Um, obviously, there was apprehension there, but no, not worried. What, um, what about, obviously, like you've gone into this and done this, and I know it's a question that we get asked a lot when we're out on the bank and doing, especially from younger people and juniors in fishing and even parents of juniors that see what we do in fishing, hmm. working in the trade. What would you say to people who have the question of, how do I work in fishing? Because you've done that now for companies and for yourself. I think it's about managing your expectations. That's the first thing. Um, you know, I, I wanted to be a journalist. That was the first thing, you know, really. When I was very young, I wanted to be a teacher. And then I, I, I realised that there was potentially the chance to write about fishing. So I, I got into it that way. So although I've worked in fishing my whole life, life and I'm, I'm lucky I've had a wonderful career, it was through the route of journalism that I got there. And that's probably my trade. If you, Even now, even though it's filmmaking, it's still the mm. same sort of thing, isn't it? It's, mm. um, so I think if you come at it objectively and say, I want to work in fishing, how can I do that? It's a lot more difficult than if you almost think, well, what industry is in fishing could I potentially work in that would allow me to be around the sport I love? Yeah and earn a living so you know media marketing there's lots of opportunities more than ever in media and marketing now isn't there yeah um there's lots of opportunities you know you can work in in, in tackle shops and retailers now and some of them pay reasonable money um the, the good ones pay reasonable money um it depends what you want to do mm. i i'd say this you'll never be a you'll never be a wealthy man unless you are a inventor or unless you are looking at some sort of career in corporate management which in my opinion, you're not working in fishing, then you're working in corporate management. Mm, mm. You ain't going to earn a lot of money in this trade, are you really, compared to anything else? But you have a lovely quality of life and you'll work with the most wonderful people and, and you're around what you love. Mm. So in answer to your question, I think it's being realistic and deciding what you want to do in the trade and then going for that that goal. When you actually think deeply about it, listening to you there, there's so many. You've, I mean, you touched on media and you touched on working in a tackle shop retail, but then... Even just thinking about what there is in this building where we are today, there's the warehouse side of it, distribution side of it, there's the product design yeah. side of it, yeah. and there's so many different angles within fishing that you probably could come Absolutely. at as well. Yeah, and um, and the nice thing is, obviously, if you're learning skills all the time as well, mm. then aren't you? And, yeah. and you can use them skills in different ways. Mm. Um, I, I think you know we've both been lucky, haven't we, in that we've. Uh, worked very hard. We've had a few breaks along the way. Um, and I think the, the younger generation, that we were talking about him earlier, young, Brent, young young Brandon, who works for you, you mm -hmm. know, what a great kid he is. He'll do very well in this trade Why? because he's got, you can see the attitudes right. You look at him and think, you know what? His passion's there. Mm -hmm. His ability, he's a great angler. He's humble. He's not one of these, you can tell the ones who aren't going to go far because they come and they've got a bit of a chip on the shoulder, aren't they? Yeah. There's none of that, you know. So, you know, among the younger generation, there's lots coming through who are going to make great careers in this. Mm. Um, he is brilliant, isn't he? I've just put his live match out in the last couple of days, and um, he was so good, man. He's fantastic, man. Yeah. It, brilliant. I, it sounds disrespectful. I didn't realise how good he was because I've never watched him fish properly. He's come out of his shell a little bit. He was a little bit shyer, though, to start with. Yeah, definitely. I wonder who that's down to. Yeah. <laughs> He's definitely had it beaten out of him yeah. somehow. Yeah. He tells Frankie what to do now. Well, everyone yeah, should tell does. Frankie what to do. Of course he should. <laughs> Um, while we're talking about different people, and uh, in particular young people, you've had um, a few people work with you at Catchmore so far on the journey. Mm. How did that side of business um, come about for you, like taking on other people or delegating some work to other people? How have you found that element of it? Well, again, you know, I, I'm going to say I've been massively lucky because I have. I've, I've fell on, on my feet with three people, really. Um, the first and you know foremost, really, uh, Rob Swan. Yeah. Um, now, Rob 
Um, I basically could see by his own social media posts, he'd got a really good grasp of social media, how to write. His pictures were always good on his, on his personal page, you know, I could see that. And so when I wanted some help writing social media posts, he was the first person I contacted. And, and he's been working with me now. It's three or four years. It's quite a while. Um, and uh, I, think, I think it might be more than four years. It was fairly early on in the journey, 2018 maybe, that he started working with me. Um, and, and I took him on in that, in that capacity. It was great for him. He was at uni. And I could like, I paid him a little bit for helping me write posts and schedule things. Mm. But then it quickly became apparent as media developed really and things like Instagram were coming to the fore, weren't they, at that time, that I wasn't the most up-to-date person with certain things, like stories, for example. In Instagram, I thought, Rob's brilliant at this. So I said to Rob, would you mind doing stories for Catch More, Instagram for Catch More? And he has. Um, and it's, it's been interesting. The way it's sort of panned out and the way I managed it is, as other clients came on board, it'd be right, you know, do you want some Instagram, what, what, what do you want sort of mm. thing? And, and if any of his services lent themselves to what I was offering, I, I paid um, Robert, so he was employed by me for quite a while. And I'd, I'd basically increase his money and say, do this for this company or whatever. Um, and he did brilliant. He, he's really got the knack. Um, yeah, I cannot sing that lad's praises highly enough. He's just, he's never let me down, Matt. Which mm, is, mm. when you think of the age group I've employed him at, probably 18, 19 to 23 or whatever he is now, 24, when that's your party time, isn't it, that, that age? There's a lot going on other than just doing a bit of work and uni, isn't there? Yeah, but he's never once faltered. Another one who, who a lot of the uh, clients who've used Catchmore will know is Jack Humphreys. He's a brilliant videographer. His company, Imagine Bound, makes some good work. I always sort of knew that, and I know this sounds weird, Matt, but... I always knew that Jack would make his money away from the fishing industry because mm. he's a massively talented videographer, uh, and but he's not an angler. He's no real interest in fishing, and it's a big world, isn't it? And, and I just thought, this lad's probably too good to earn his money in fishing. He'll want to go and do other things, and mm. that's what he's doing now, which is really good. He does, still does some work for Browning, I think, and one or two others, but he's, he's, he's mainly his, his, his business is outside of fishing. And the third one, um, who I've come to, lately really is um gary rogers um now gary he had his own event his company uh, on the fly tv um i wanted to stop doing events which we'll come on to in a, in a minute did my head in so i didn't do them for a while and then the opportunity came to work with gary to promote a few events uh, for him and, and that's that's gone on to be our the next chapter of our project really and, mm. and working with gary is brilliant because you know he's, he's again he's got the passion you can tell um, he really wants to do it. And I think that, um, you know, going forward, I'm working more closely than ever with Rob and Gary now. And I think that that's going to grow and grow. There's one other person I want to give a mention to here as well. I can't not, um, who's helped me massively with Catch More Media. Uh, and it's somebody you might not expect, but Jordan Holloway. Mm. Um, you know, he's one of my best mates, as you know. And like, the thing with him is he's so objective. And, and you always need that person, I think, in your life who tells you, no, or tells you, that's not a very good idea, Tom. Well, that's mm. stupid, Tom, isn't it? Why are you going to do that? And Jordan has been that man. He, he's never, he's, he's been positive as well. I'm not saying it in a, so that he's Mr. Negative, because he's not. He's helped me loads. He's worked with me. And, I'm, 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 you know, he is right at the heart of what I do in many ways. Um, but he's always been um, never afraid to give me an honest and frank opinion if something's a bad idea. Which, he's blunt, in he, George? Yeah. Very blunt. Which is great, um, you know. So, uh, yeah, he's a big part of it as well. Definitely. Interesting. Very interesting. Um, you talked about, obviously, events and different people coming in, like Gary, to manage different sides of it and help you with different sides of it. How has the company evolved in terms of what you actually do? I mean, you started doing some pretty basic media work, photography hmm. and filming for companies. How's that changed throughout Catchmore Media in the five or six years you've been doing it? Well, there's two evolutions I want to talk about with regard to that then. Um, the first one would be I've wanted to evolve Catchmore more recently um, because what happened, what's happened is, if you imagine we were probably slightly ahead of the curve with social media, so we were offering services to companies to create social media content for them. As they've realized the importance of this, a lot of these have employed their own people now to do that job for them. Mm. So... Um, you know, I almost half expected we'd lose some area, some aspect of that. But more than ever now, there's the opportunity to earn money through good content, YouTube, 
um, you know, you can generate income that way. And also through things like channel memberships, making exclusive content for people. So that's where we've put our efforts over the last 12 months. And what's that? More of their people will pay to view the content you're making. Absolutely. Got you. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, the, the, the industry leaders in this are probably uh, winning ways, for example. You know, yeah. they, they do mem memberships. They've done it very successfully for a long time. And while we're not trying to compete with them, because what we offer is very different, um, it's it's that's the sort of model I looked at and thought, you know what? As a as a revenue stream, I mean, I'm very, you know me, I'm very against putting all my eggs in one basket. Mm. I like a few different revenue streams, but I thought that let's let's look at that, and um, it's been great because it's let me go back to that original thing I spoke about, which is the passion, and I really want to see our Christian Jones fish as a match now. It suits my fishing. I want to go out with him. Like, let's go out and make a live match with Christian, and it's brilliant. You know, I'm really buzzing for it again. Uh, and hopefully that comes through in the, in the work I'm created. And the other thing um, that's been really transformative for me, in not just in in uh, work, but also in my life, really, has been working with um, David Preston and the team at Fuka. Um, I got a phone call from him in 2018, I think it was, or 2019. 2019. Um, he was just basically looking at pushing the launch of a two-in-one bait. Did you know David at the time? I'd met him once. Uh, I'd met him once before. There's a bit of a funny story here, actually. Um, I think it was before you joined DHP. Mm. We were invited to Docklow on a press day. I always remember uh, there was David Hall, Sean O'Driscoll, myself. Uh, I think Dave Harrell were there then. And we all went down to Docklow for this press day. And um, the way it worked, you went around and saw all the different anglers doing the different, demonstrating the products. And Ricky Teal, who was the... Managing Director of Preston, then gave a talk. So it's uh, a Preston Innovations Press yes, Day. Yes, it's a Got Preston it. Innovations Press Day at Dock Low Pools. And then it was time for uh, a bit of food, which, you know, is always great for me. Love it. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm sat next to this bloke, a uh, little bloke with glasses, and he's, he's talking about carp fishing. And uh, he's saying how wonderful it is, and he's saying how match anglers are, like jokingly, you know, we're having a joking exchange, but he's like, match anglers are... The problem with you lot is you only bloody want, you know, you want it all straight away. And I can't remember the, the banter, but we're having this banter. <laughs> and uh, and so I'm giving it back to him. I just thought, I, I thought, I don't know why, I thought it worked for Angler's Mail. I thought it was like a, a junior report on Angler's Mail. So I'm, <laughs> I'm, I'm giving it back to him. And we had a, a brilliant, all good fun, but it was quite a robust exchange you'd expect with two people just, you know, yeah. giving each other a bit of stick like. Next thing I felt his hand on my shoulder and it's Sean O'Driscoll. He said, everything all right, yeah? Did you have fine? I'm just having a, having a laugh. <laughs> And uh, turned down, and David's gone off to see somebody else. He says, well, David Preston, that was. He owns all this. He owns it. I said, all right. <laughs> I didn't know that. <laughs> Honestly, I had no idea. No idea. So I'd met him once before. That's um, a great story, that. <laughs> uh, and in many ways, you know, I, I, I've been blessed because we, we, we've sort of um, picked up where we left off in many ways because I sort of told him this the first time I met him, and um, he, he found it hilarious. And, and we've worked together ever since in, in some way or another. Um, to start with, it, I was just sort of freelance for them, um, you know, filming of the baits and taking the bait around to different places and stuff. And uh, it's been brilliant in two ways for me. But, but the, main, the main way is I've got to see how his mind works in setting up and establishing this brand, mm. you know, pretty much from word go. And the word genius is banded about far too easily, but... In my mind, him and his missus between them, Catherine, Catherine are geniuses at mm -hmm. what they do. They're, they're, they're great. Um, you know, it, it's brilliant product. It catches loads of fish. And then, I mean, you can remember as well as I can, it, it's not it's not been the smoothest of journeys as you'd expect. It's not like we've put every product out there and everyone's gone, wow, this is amazing. We've had a bit of stick along the way, but seeing how they dealt with that, seeing the whole, the whole journey and the objectivity of it, um, it's just been inspirational, really, for, for me. Mm. Um, so, yeah, that, that's been the other thing. I've actually worked for Fuka for about 12 months full-time. I sort of let Rob and Jack at that time carry catch more on and manage it in my absence. And I, I, I worked full-time for, for David for about 12 months up to last October. Um, and what, what changed there? I'll be honest, I was missing the freedom of working for myself. And, mm. that, and there was never, don't get me wrong, there was never any hint of... Ma of negativity in our relationship between me and David, it was quite literally. I'll be honest, Matt, what happened was I was given a very generous amount of holidays uh, by Fuka. But still, 
I was thinking, oh, I want to fish the Wye Festival in November. And somehow I've used me 40 days or whatever it was. Right. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I really fancy being on that Wye Festival. I'm like, hmm. Yeah. And, and then the more I thought about it, the more I thought it probably worked best for both of us because I felt by being a bit pigeonholed, it changed my mentality a bit. Mm. I became, I didn't want to become uh, single-minded in, in what I did. And I, I worried that having seen how the freedom you can have when you're fully self-employed, you know, so I, I, I spoke to David and he, he was really happy to, to work with me in whatever way he could. And David and Catherine, you know, um, were happy to let me go back freelance and I've, I've been doing that since really. So it's, um, it, it works for, for everybody now. When, um, when I listen to you talk about it like that now, you, you seem to have this underlying, I'm going to say a bit of a superpower of if you fancy something or you're not quite sure but you're going to give it a go. Like, you just go for it and do it. So, catch more. The leap to actually do that in the first place. Then, I've just got this catch more media business. It's growing. It's doing great. Oh, full-time opportunity at Fuka. Nice little... Let's give that a go. You two take care of my business. I'm going to crack on and do this. Mm, that's not really working. You have this, like... If something's slightly wrong or you want to do something, you just immediately seem to approach it in a positive way and it opens a positive gate for you either into something or out of something. Mm, that, mm. That's quite unique, I think. I think it's about frame of mind, really. And and also, I think, being nice and being positive, generally. I honestly believe that if you are nice and positive with people and you're a good person and mm. you try and do a good job and you, you know, then you get it back. Mm. When, you always do. I, I, think. I, I personally, and I think I'm probably speaking on behalf of quite a few people, I'd be a bit worried about having worked for a company for 12 months to then say, look, I don't really want to do this anymore. I want to go back and work for myself. You never have that like... It wasn't quite like that, to be honest. I get what you mean. Mm. Um, but it was much more about, I still want to do this. This is what I do really well. That, mm. that was what it was. It was, I'm, I feel I'm, I'm, I'm good at fishing with the bait and showing its benefits and advantages. Loads of confidence, caught loads of fish on it. Um, I wasn't so good at certain aspects of the job, uh, in my own opinion. You know, like, for example, I'm not the best at design type things where it's writing an, an email, for example, that go, I can do it, I can do the writing side of it, but making it all look pretty, not me. And it's the same as I said with Catchmore. I'd learned this, I knew this already. You know, these, these things I do really well, these things I don't do so well. And at this time... Fuka's growing fast, don't forget. So we've got all this other part of the job that's opening up that I'm thinking my skills perhaps aren't ideally suited here. Mm. So why don't I just do what I'm good at? Mm. And, and, and as you know from David's podcast, that fits into his mindset as well. He mm. wants people doing what they're good at and what they enjoy. So really, when we spoke about it, it was very easy for both of us. I'm saying to him, David, I really want to do this for you and I want to do and, and this is why. And he's like, well, I want you to do that because that's what you're good at, and we'll 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 we'll, we'll adapt in that way. But in terms of what you say about confidence to do things and superpowers and stuff, I, I don't think it's a superpower. I think it's a, um, I think if it's just a, quite, it's probably quite a pragmatic way of thinking actually, and and it does tend to work. If and you must, I'll be honest, Matt, you're the biggest example of it, an advocate of it yourself. You're a very well liked, positive, good person, and look at where you've got to. Hmm. Ended up doing a podcast with some horrible people. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think I think the bottom line is um, looking at the decisions you've made. I mean, just what we've spoke about so far in this show is you you're not worried about it going wrong. You take the step. You you're not that scared of failing in any way. It never really seems to cross your mind yeah, yeah. that much. I've had 36 years of failing. Well, you've had as much as I've had. <laughs> <laughs> it doesn't matter anymore. You know but what it, I mean? It's, it's decisive, isn't it? Yeah, that's it, what it is. very it decisive. Is. It, yeah. It's it's ha the idea and going, right, I know what I'm going to do. And there's no, that's it. You just do it. Try it. Chuck it and see a little bit. Um, mm. You know, don't, there's obviously limits to it. I've not done anything that decisive. It's not like I've, you know, there's people out mm. there who take decisions every day that are far more decisive than anything I've ever done. Doctors, no, I, and... I think you're doing yourself a disservice there, actually, because I, I I found it quite interesting from your perspective is when you guys come here for the interview and Matt got the job uh, and you didn't. That must have been a really difficult situation to kind of go because you went back to your job and it was like, <coughs> oh, that's not going to work. So you it, it didn't not get the job though. You decided not to take. Yeah, the job. sorry, I didn't know. It, that. Yeah, yeah, what yeah, happened yeah. was it was right. interesting. Um, 
basically the offer to me yeah, 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 we both came down. They wanted to take both of us on. That was the first thing. And then right. we, me and Matt both said, "We are not living down south down here. We don't like it. It's full of southerners." No, <laughs> yeah. we, didn't. we didn't say that. But we said southerners are called No, we didn't say that. We said, um, <laughs> "Look, our fishing, our lives are based in the northern Midlands. We don't want to do do that." Yeah. yeah. Um, and then Ali Hamidi uh, rung me, and he really wanted. He, they basically, I think, decided they wanted to take one of us on. Then didn't they? Mm. Uh, and Ali Amidi made a really generous offer, but it, it was based around moving down here. To right, Basel, okay. To, and yeah, and, yeah. and that was the one thing about it that was immovable. Yeah, yeah. And and to me, that was immovable because I like the north. I like fishing up there. I like my friends and family were all up there. Um, and so I had to, I had to turn it down, really. Um, yeah, yeah, that's fair enough. And then f they sort of, after that, after I turned, they approached you, didn't they? And they actually changed the offer slightly, didn't they? Mm. Mm. They let me stay up north. <laughs> yeah, which was yeah. great <laughs> yeah and had his extra salary on top of yeah, yeah that's it yeah. <laughs> I, no, wish I, I wish I did I, no but it, it's a commendable move to, to then come back and go well actually I've got this idea I'm gonna I'm gonna crack on by myself no that is that is decisive mate it um yeah it, it was one of them it, uh, at the time it's all about your circumstances mate and, and, and at the time it was an easy-ish decision um, mm. and touch wood I've not regretted it you know good you, you mentioned something earlier I want to touch on again you said oh, I did me head in and you were talking about events, um, I think, at the time. Mm. What do you think of events? It's something you've played around with a lot with Catchmore and you're still involved with now at the minute. And you said, oh, I did me head in. Mm. What, what, tell me a little bit about events and Catchmore. Yeah, well, I'll be honest. In the early stages, um, obviously, you and I have run events before. We, we'd run events with the magazine, uh, Pole Fishing Pairs we ran. Daryl Pole Fishing Masters, you and I started back in 2014, didn't we? Mm -hmm. Um with Sarah at Tunnel Barn. Yeah, with Sarah and Stephen McCaveney. And uh, so with some experience in the area, um, and I was there obviously with this new channel, and I wanted to get all the top anglers on it. And I thought, what's the easiest way to do that? And I thought, I know, we'll do some events. So Pole Masters was the first one, which luckily we'd already got. So I, could, I was able to keep that because Pole Fishing Magazine didn't want it as I left DHP. Um, so I, I, I took that. Um, and then there was, uh, I ran a winter championship, Tunnel Bar Winter Champs, which you'll remember. Yeah. And it was brilliant because it was a mechanism for me. I could get these events sponsored. I could earn some money off the back of them. Um, and it got big named anglers on the channel, got good views on the channel as well. You know, all of a sudden I could walk around a venue and do a live video with Des Ship, Andy Bennett, Matt Godfrey, whoever, you know. Mm -hmm. Um, and back then, of course, I think fishing was probably a bit less, uh, fragmented and, we literally had some of them events, some of them winter champs were like the who's who were match fishing, weren't they? Mm. Fantastic at Tunnel Barn. Um, but, and this is where, um, as I said, it, it did get a bit more difficult for me. I found there was some perceptions of negativity with the running of events, which I wasn't comfortable with. Um, and that was, you know, people don't like the idea of somebody making money out of events. You know, that's simple as that, really. Um which I get, you know, I'm a match angler myself and I've heard all the arguments under the sun. Um, but at the end of the day, most of the time the way I made the money was by getting sponsorships. It wasn't coming out of anglers' pockets directly. It was like, you know, I'm doing some filming. That means it's prize money or prizes going into the pot. Yes, I'm taking some money out to cover the filming, but there's money going in other ways or prizes going in other mm. ways. So, you know, that was how I would justify it if, if you need to justify it that, that's how i used to run it you know um but then i just felt most of the things i were doing i was getting massively appreciated for getting a lot of support on social media and stuff and i had a couple of incidents um with event running one of which was on a winter champs it was a a well-known angler who uh who we both know i had a right you know right got me on this particular day told me i pegged it awfully and all this and uh i was Really nasty to me, actually. I was shouting across the lake about this particular peg. And I, I, I not really knew what he was talking about. So I went back and said, Sarah, what's that peg, you know, that um, he's, he's talking about there? She said, he's always in. Anyway, lo and behold, he won the lake off this peg that was awful. But the way he spoke to me was... The same day that he's on yeah, it, drawn it. Yeah, yeah. All yeah, right. Yeah. And I thought, gosh, I don't need this, really. Mm, mm. Um, and then there was another thing. Uh, I ran a pairs match up at Lindo. And I'll always remember, this This was the point where I said, I'm never doing events again. Um, I ran a pairs match up at Lindome on the Saturday. And um, I got a, a, 
a balance sheet, as I always do. And after the match, um, nobody said a word. It was great. Did the payout. Off I went. Day after, I'm on a Riverfest qualifier on the Trent, Tidal Trent. I'm just getting set up at um, North Clifton. Yeah. And the match is about to start, and I get a text on my phone from the venue um, saying, uh, we've had a few people question where the more the money's gone from yesterday. Do you mind sending us a balance sheet? So straight away in my mind, I'm thinking, who's asking that? Why are they asking it? Sent this balance sheet. There wasn't any, from memory, there was, you know, there was, uh, it was all transparent. Anyway, there wasn't any money missing or anything like that. No. It was all there and transparent. So I sent this balance sheet off. But in the back of my mind, then, for the first hour or so of the match, I'm thinking, who was asking that then? What's the problem? Should I have done it differently? Or have I done anything wrong? You know, and, and it, it, you know what I'm like in the sense I'm, I'm not bothered about things, but I am quite conscientious. I'd hate to think I'd done anybody a wrong mm. turn or done anything bad or anything like that. And I hadn't, you know. But it doesn't stop you asking yourself the question. It's it going to be you. heavily on your mind. Yeah, yeah. You're like, oh gosh, you know, should I have done it differently? Or... And um, I ended up finished the match. I weighed £10.04 uh, and the section zone was won with 10.15. 10.15 qualified for the Riverfest final. And I know for a fact, if I had not had that, on my mind, mm. I'd have qualified. So I remember I said to Jordan, driving home, I said, Jordan, I'm not, not doing this anymore, mate. Um, and I haven't really. I mean, obviously, Gary and I are working together, but he's doing it now. I'm not touching the, the actual running of the events. It's, that's Gary's area. The pole masters, I work with Sarah on it. I oversee it. I cover it. Comfortable with that. Um, you know, and I, but from that point forwards, I was like, I'm not doing it anymore. Mm. Um mm. And look, you know, I'm not, it's hard for me because I'm a match angler myself and I'll happily stand there and moan about my peg sometimes because you're in that competitive environment, you're there, you're fishing. So I wouldn't call anybody really because I'd, I'd be a hypocrite if I did. We all do it. Well, what's this bloody pegging for? I shouldn't be fishing here. Yeah, it's a bit tightly pegged around that <laughs> corner there. They could have spaced them yeah, out a little bit. Yeah, look at that. You've got it. I mean, you yeah. know, you've done, you're the same as me. You've, 100%. you've seen it from both angles. Mm. Um, <clears throat> and what I will say is the people who do run the matches, you know, Gary and Alf, uh, who works with me um, you know they deserve all the credit they get because it mm. is a thankless task it it's, really is I find the concept of um, match organisers not being able to take some money out quite difficult to deal with like I think match organisers quite a strong opinion of mine mm. I think match organisers should make some money out mm. of running an event and, and I think it's a very unprofessional view and part of angling that people who run big events and get big names to an event can't have some financial benefit out of it. Any other sport, look at your Eddie Hearns and and all them people who generate hype and competition in a competitive environment in their arena. That's how they make a ridiculously good living, mm. getting the best sports people together to compete for people to watch, enjoy, view. Watch it on Catch More Media. Your coverage, fantastic. But you can't get that kind of entertainment, information, names, knowledge on screens and in front of people free of charge. No, no, it, it doesn't work, does it? No. It's as simple as that. Um, yeah, I mean, I mean, like, look at the Pole Masters this year. I mean, it's, it's been good because I've had a sort of overview of that, working with Sarah and everybody else, Stephen, as before. Um, Stephen you know, McAvney at Day yeah, Hour. Yeah, yeah. I, sent, I sent some figures over to them a couple of weeks ago about this year's event. So this year, that the Pole Masters coverage that Gary and I did reached 1.3 million people. Phenomenal. 95% of them, by the way, in the UK. So it's not like we're appealing to a, an irrelevant audience. Mm -hmm. This is the angling for well, people who've got an interest in angling. Yeah. You know, massive numbers. Um, from that, you know, we we, we generated, and, and, and obviously you've got to have a willing sponsor, which Dyer are, but... There was an awful lot of value in prize money put into it in terms of prizes. Mm. Um, Dyer Airs had a pro for the winner, Aerity Pro for the biggest weight of the week, Hydro Bundle for everybody. I can't think off the top of my head, but you're certainly talking seven grand plus RRP of, of tackle for people to win who are there. So it adds value to the event. You know, and what, mm -hmm. yes, we took a bit of money out to, to cover the filming. Um, what about your time, though, that you're there for and Gary's time that he's there for f at these events to cover? Mm. Can you just be there from 7 a.m. in the morning until 7 at night, free of charge, no. walking around with the camera? No. It doesn't work, does it? Of course it doesn't. Um, so, yeah, I mean, that, that that was where I got to with it. It's, um, you know, I, 
I share your view very strongly. If we want this sport to be more professional, then we need to be comfortable with that. Mm. Uh, but we also need, we have got you know some expectation for sponsorship. And I think that's quite fair, isn't it? If, if, if you are paying some money in, you do expect a well-run match and you do expect potentially some sponsorship mm. for the back of it. And that's what we try and offer as well. Mm. Um, so Gary's now doing a great job. You know, he's really um, managing these events. Um, I'm helping him with the promotion through Catchmore. And uh, yeah, I think, I think events-wise, hopefully over the next few years, we'll see bigger and bigger things from, from, from Gary's side of it because... Yeah, he, he's uh, he's a lot more uh, bullish than me, as you'll probably know. He's brutal, isn't he, Gary? <laughs> he is brutal, to be fair. Flipping heck. I wouldn't argue with him. No, no, me neither. No. He's a farmer as well, isn't he? Oh, he's all sorts, yeah. mate. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. Rugby player, farmer, accountant, you name it. He's all of them. Yeah. Um, in terms of everything we're talking about, it's all very, you know, work-related and heavy so far, and I'm sure everyone listening is itching to talk a little bit of fishing um, hmm. and i think a nice way we can sort of lead into that is all the time you've been doing what we've spoke about so far catch more even before it the magazine days right up through to running the events now you've maintained a very fruitful fishing life as well and i think that that has given you a ridiculously healthy work-life balance how have you managed to maintain that and and what's been your mindset behind doing that throughout it all? What, you mean the work-life balance, or do you mean the... Yeah, the work-life balance of being able to do this business, set up Catch More Media, but still do a ridiculous amount of fishing and enjoy it in a great way. I think um, I think, I think think that you've summed it up there. It's, it's the enjoyment and the passion of it. So I, I'm, I'm, there's certain things that I need to have a happy life. I need exercise. Got to get out every day and have some exercise, whether it's a gym or a walk. You won't always know it to look at me because I've got a bit of a uh, bay window on me these days. <laughs> but I do, I really do like to, you know, get out there and have a, at least an hour a day doing something because, like that, that's so important to me when you talk about work-life balance. Good diet, like eating good food. Like, and I'm on about, you know, how, how how easy it is in our job, and it's the same for a lot of people who travel around a lot with work and in different places. You can easily eat fast food, but it's no good for you whatsoever, is it? So, as you know, I, I like the. Uh, the pub meals and the uh, have a pint and a bite mm. to eat after a day out. It annoyed you last night, didn't it? I dragged you into a for a curry on the way down. Oh, it? ridiculous. <laughs> Done a day's filming on River Trent yesterday, filming yeah. a vlog, right? Gets back to my house at quarter to seven last night. Yeah, We've yeah. got a three and a bit hour drive down to Essex, an hour into the journey. This one makes a phone call, books us in at a curry house. No, on see, I can, I can get on board with that. That's the kind of travelling you should be doing. But then we're not getting down here till <laughs> half past 11 at night. And... Yeah, but at least you've already eaten. I, well, this is, this is his him. argument. No, I totally agree with you. Yeah, at the end of the day, he's, uh, he's yeah, eating a good meal, right? Yep. He's let it settle for an hour and a half while we're driving down. He gets in and goes to bed. Go straight to bed. You haven't it, had it, a Mackey's, have yeah. you, and eating it whilst driving? If it's suggested something, I can't remember, Taco Bell or something? I oh, could... you didn't. No, I thought we could get it and eat while we were driving down, you know, bit of food on the go, that kind of thing. Saving yeah. a bit of time. I was tired, I wanted to go to bed. <laughs> I bet it... you were even more tired after a belly full of curry, wouldn't you? You, you, can't, uh, you <laughs> can't ever go to sleep when you're travelling with you because of his music choice. Oh, yeah, we have good, good music, that's important. Isn't it? That's, that's work-life balance, isn't it? Got a bit a good bit of dire straits on didn't we yeah. who did we have last night we had dire straits beautiful south beautiful south elton john we had some johnny cash johnny cash yeah oh we had we had some classics yeah tina turner we did have a bit of tina turner proud mary she she come out to play didn't yeah. she yeah yeah <laughs> um yeah it, it it's i think it's a state of mind mate you've got to i'll tell you who's brilliant at this as well who, who probably taught me a bit about this nick speed you know mm. work-life balance right just eat well make sure you've got time to exercise sleep Make sure you've got time to go to mm. bed, turn everything off, sleep. Mm. Yeah. Mm. Ex hamster as well before you sleep. Yeah. Yeah. Always. Some nice viewing. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that. What about um what about the fishing itself? Did your fishing ever suffer um while you were kicking off catch more or I'd be lying if I said it didn't, but I tried to keep it as brief as possible. Mm. Um it, it's the problem is, mate, when you're focused on something, as I was for that first 12, 18 months while I was setting catch more up, um, obviously your mind's on that one thing pretty much exclusively. Uh, but I was able fairly quickly to come back into what I'd like to say is competing at, a, at the level I want to be at with my match fishing. Mm. Um, but I mean, yeah, it, it did. Um, 
that it's so important to me. Like being a, you know, at the end of the day, based on you know, everything I've said about having a trade within within the fishing industry as a way in is true. But it's important to always remember. I only got into this for one thing because I love fishing. Mm. Like you know, I can write about anything. It doesn't have to be fishing. But I got into the fishing industry because. I love fishing, so I had to. I think you have to always keep that front of mind as well. Mm. And, and as quick as possible, I got back to doing the kind of match fishing I wanted to be doing, enjoying it, and and you know winning regularly, which is important to me. Like I wanted to be competing at a high level and and keep my keep my match fishing career progressing. I suppose that's a good way of putting I th- it. I think there'll be people listening to this, um, probably feeling a little bit bad, and some feeling really good about it. But I've seen people come into fishing. And I know people have come into fishing because they love fishing, ended up working in it, and it's had the negative effect on it. And to the point they now don't go fishing, mm. but they're stuck in working in fishing. Mm. That definitely happens. It happens. It happens an awful lot, and it's it's tragic. Mm. It's tragic. I mean, it, it would be like you or me going to work for a knitting company and making knitting videos, wouldn't it? Mm. I know you're into your knitting, so not so bad for you, but like, <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean? You might as well do something unrelated. And, yeah. and then all of a sudden, you, your life has gone a funny route then, and you're off, you're off piece a bit, aren't mm. you? Um, mm. So, no, I mean, I, I've, I've, I love my fishing as much now as I did that first time I, I went on a match, you know, and did well. Um, and like, yeah, it, it, it's, it's really important, I think, to keep that love and enjoyment of it going you know you know if it's not going stop mm. simple as that you can't force it but like to me i think it's about giving it time and and, and i do that you know like it should we get another coffee for ah, the next bit sounds good cheeky little brew back cheeky little brew <laughs> break you know i'm keeping that in tell you know. <laughs> posh coffee machine here and you can tell where money is can't you it's great <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah toby brought it out in his house yeah. <laughs> mate honestly you should see it since that's come in right every hour you walk past it it's a queue of staff just waiting there and the machine's wearing away i'm thinking it's a freshly ground arabica bean don't you? <laughs> <laughs> you can't beat an arabica bean can you, on, can you pal strong um, and aromatic just like you oh yes <laughs> we've just been saying oh off camera and i think we should probably talk about it because it's very relevant to everything we've been talking about have, have you ever had any like major mess ups in in media in what you're doing oh yeah yeah over the years two spring to mind go on one of which i take full responsibility for one of which technically i suppose i am but not really the first one is went down with chavy richard chave richard chave on the bristol haven and he spent all day catching me about a thousand bleak blessing, which I took a picture of in a lovely big keep net. Great feature, all about his approach to bleak fishing on the Bristol Haven. Came back to DHP, put it in the office drawer. Now, what do you mean you put it in the office drawer? Memory card, out the camera with all these pictures on. Thought okay. I'll sort that out later. Really busy week. I thought I'll sort that out later. Should have thought a bit more about it though, because the problem we used to have at DHP, and I bet you still have it now, actually working with the, the, the great unwashed, the carp fisherman. Yeah, uh, is. Bean eating bivy boys. Yeah, bean eating bivy boys. They'd come through um, and nick our memory cards out of our drawers. Right. In fact, we did it to them as well, as you'll remember. It was all a free for all, wasn't it? Mm. But um, they used to nick our memory cards if they couldn't find any. And lo and behold, went in the desk drawer to get the memory card with these pictures on a couple of weeks later. Gone. No. Whole day lost. Whole feature gone. It's not even a short drive to Bristol Haven. No. <laughs> no, that was a disaster. Oh. Um, and the other one, which is, uh, you'll probably remember actually, because I think we were both at DHP at this point, was when uh, there was a bit of a print error in Match Fishing Magazine and all the type tightened up a little bit on the page, slightly more than it should have been. And I saw the colour proofs for the magazine and I thought, that's all right, I didn't notice this. Oh! Oh, oh bloody hell. Mean, talk- have the toaster on. Talking about <laughs> media errors. <laughs> Right, uh, that must be a drill. Yeah, yeah. We'll carry we'll on. Yeah. Keep going. Carry on. Um, happened before on a podcast, didn't it? Yeah, it's happened on quite a few. <laughs> happened on <laughs> Nuddy. It happened on Nuddy. That's it? where yeah. I forget to cut them out. <laughs> 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 Talking about media errors. <laughs> no, it, type of tightened up a bit, and it didn't play well. Didn't bear out well for poor old Clint Elliot, because you can imagine if you tighten the L and the I up in Clint, ah, you end up with. <laughs> A bit of a situation. A rude word. Yes. Ah. Um, but anyway, we're fine about it. So. Clint Elliot. <laughs> right. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. So that went out. That was good. I don't know. Um, 
<laughs> well, that's about it, Paul. But you, you know, there were one particular day I did feel bad. And again, it's not exactly a mess up on your part, but I did feel guilty. There was one match fishing event in particular after I took over that I left for you to run. Yeah. And I'm not blaming you, Paul, but it's the only event I've ever known where somebody's died. <laughs> We shouldn't really laugh about it, but it's true. Um, yeah. God, I remember that. Terrible, wasn't it? Yeah. It was, um... Not even joking. What? So what happened? Basically, we used to run this Club Angler of the Year, Garbolino Club Angler of the Year, mm. wasn't it? Yeah. And um, poor old boy, I can't remember his name, um, but he was a el- very elderly fella. Basically, the end of the match, shouted time, shipped his pole in, had an heart attack and died. Mate, that's actually horrendous. Yeah, he had an heart attack. He, he fell in the lake. <laughs> mm. No. I remember, I was just walking in between like Willers and Laurels. They were on mm. Laurels on that first point. Big splash. This bloke from Other Lake come, dived in, dragged him out, got him on bank, and did CPR for however long it took for ambulance yeah. and that to come. But they reckon he, he were dead before he hit the water, bless him. He, he actually did really well in he that event. He won his section, didn't he? I he remember d- you saying. He did it a few times. Like I think he'd won it or he'd framed the year before as well. Yeah. Um, but he'd have, he's obviously had some heart problems yeah, in that because yeah, when, yeah. when they dragged him out at Lake, we cut his shirt off immediately so we could get a defibrillator and stuff mm. like that on him. And um, he got a big scar where he'd had some so problems. Obviously, had yeah. some surgery mm. or something. Nightmare yeah, yeah. on an that's, event, really. That's pretty horrific. Though. Yeah, it weren't very yeah. nice. Were you in charge of the event? Yeah. Yeah. So you had to deal with everything that followed, I'd imagine. Pretty much. They weren't that much, to be fair. Yeah. He, he died. Mm. He had an heart attack he, and died. His family you know? knew, didn't they, from memory? Yeah. I think I think, um, oh. I think you or, or, or I spoke to them, and, and basically, he, <coughs> it wasn't. I wouldn't say it was expected, but it wasn't exactly unexpected, was right. it, from what yeah, they said. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And hey, if you're going to go anyway, joking aside, if I could choose now how I was going to leave this life, finishing a match when you know you've done well, what a great way to go that would be. Just yeah. bang, gone. Better than months of suffering, isn't it? Of course it is. Yeah, well of course said. It is. I always say... You know, I'd like to dry, die quickly, without pain, and in my sleep, like my granddad did. Not kicking and screaming like all his passengers. <laughs> 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 oh, God. Absolutely terrible. All right. um, on to fishing. I want to talk about fishing a little bit to you now. Yep. Um, and I'm going to kick this part off by asking you a bit of a potent question. Um, uh, I mean, and you can start talking from whichever point of your fishing you want in it but what if you wanted to get out of your fishing in the time that you've been doing it um early on i grew up reading match fishing magazine uh and that was my sort of source of angling media like so many people of my age i suppose as a young and there were no facebook or youtube even then or youtube might have been there but there weren't much fishing on it um and it was you know that was what we read wasn't it mm. you'll remember those days and my goal was always to be an all-round angler. Um, I wanted to be somebody like, I read columns by Darren Cox, for example, you know, um, John Arthur, mm. you know. These people were going to canals, winning, rivers, winning, coming back, going on a commercial, winning. Will Rays, and he had a great column in there as well. Um, and, and like, you know, I'd look forward to Will's in particular. He'd read about Whitakers. Steve Ringer, another one who he'd read mm. about back then, who was, you know, winning on a quite a variety of different fishing. Um, and I wanted to be somebody who could do everything. I didn't want to be pigeonholed. Um, but the truth is, growing up in my early fishing years, I knew that really it was commercial fishing for me because around Sheffield at that time, that's all there was. you know. Mm. It, um, and, uh, and so in terms of big aims, it was to be an all-rounder and really to win the Drone Knockout Cup, which I was lucky enough to do eventually um and the journey there was brilliant really i look back at it so fondly because i had to learn so so much Mm. Uh, so that was what i wanted out of it then i think now if you put that in the modern context it's to continue to be competitive on all disciplines 100 percent. but this year i've had a slightly different year to normal and then i focus much more on commercial fishing and the reason for that is I feel more than ever that the standard on commercials is high and getting better and better. And I felt I was slipping behind a little bit, you know. So mm-hmm. I thought I need to put some focus onto that. But yeah, I mean, I, I, I like I pride myself on the fact I've won big events on rivers, canals, commercials. You know, mm. that that that's my very interesting. Aim. 
And when you talk about you wanted to be this all rounder, um, what sort of areas of your fishing helped you become that? You know, what kind of venues did you fish, or what? I mean, you've you've had little stints of fishing very seriously at a high level on specific venues at different times of the year. Tell us a little bit about some of them and the things that they taught you in your fishing on the journey to be to becoming this all round angler. Um, well, I mean, if I start from the beginning, I, I was really lucky in that I grew up with um, a very good club in Sheffield, Woods mm. Angling, you know, and, and it was actually three separate clubs that, that we fished with at that time. And most of these uh, events and clubs were run by a chap called Mark Holmes, who you know very well anyway. Yeah, he's got a tackle shop in Woods Seats, hasn't he? Yeah, has, Woods Seats Angling. And, um, you know, Mark was brilliant with me as, mm. as a young lad. He, 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 there they are. They're there the they Woodseats boys. That's him, yeah. Um, and uh, you can see Mark's one at back with his eyes shut. Look, he'll, he'll not be happy when he sees me. They didn't pick a better picture. But, Look at uh, Tomo at front on left. Yeah, that's him. But they're all the lads who I grew up club fishing with, and they all taught me so, so much. Um, you know, and, and got me there. I, I couldn't drive till I was 21, so I got a job and... Mm. Um, you know, they, these guys would pick me up and take me fishing every Saturday, Sunday, whenever I wanted to go. Wednesdays as well, sometimes we'd sneak off. Yeah. Um, but that tackle shop, Wood Seats Angling, was just around the corner from where I lived. So I could walk there with my gear. That's what I used to do, walk around with my gear, get picked up from there, and off we'd go. And, and, and you know, not only were these really good to me as club anglers, but they were also brilliant standard of anglers. I mean, Paul Donnelly, who you can see, sat down there. He's a ex-team angler with some of the best teams in Sheffield. Mark himself fished with a lot of the best teams in Sheffield. Tom O was really good on the Trent in its heyday. You know, they're, they're mm. all brilliant anglers in their own right. Terry Oldfield, that he's battered me a few times. Yeah, old Tets, yeah. It, it, they were. Um, so these guys had taken me fishing all over. Um, and they taught me how to have fun as well. I mean, it wasn't, obviously, it was club fishing, so it was much more about the day out. We'd have a breakfast, we'd have a fish all day, then we'd go and have a few pints after and often get into all kinds of uh, states on a Thursday night as well. You know, it was very much about, um, I always remember a funny thing we used to do. I used to work in an Italian restaurant as a pot washer at this, uh, when I was young. And uh, opposite the, the restaurant was a pub where they all went. Right. So I, I, the deal would be, I used to finish at 11. And I'd say, right, when I finish pot washing, we do me a pizza. So I'd do, do me this pizza and I'd run over the road with it. And if I got the pizza, they'd have a couple of pints waiting for me. So... I'd finish, I'd finish at 11, run this pizza off at road. They'd have this pizza, which I mean, if they're just finishing the night out, I'd have a couple of pints to, after my shift. It was great. That's brilliant, isn't it? <laughs> but, absolutely uh, brilliant. Oh, they're, they're, they're great. Absolutely. You know, like when you look back and you think, I oh, was just blessed to grow up with them people. Mm. Like, you know, from mm. 16, when I, I could start going with them, to 21, I fished every weekend and they took me fishing. They gave me bits and bobs. They taught me so much. Mm. Um, you know, and you know something else with them? Matt as well, they were very good mentors in that they told me, look, you need to push yourself at this. You're, you, you're, you're good. You can be really good. You need to, you know, and they encouraged me to go on fish opens. I remember Mark Holmes saying to me one day in the shop, you need to go on fish open matches now. And when you think about that, for him to say that, you know, I was going on his matches, I was using his shop. It was probably working against his best interests to say that because I'm not using his shop as much and whatever else. Mm. But he said it and he, he meant it and I did it, you know, um, one lad who was not on that picture, I can't not mention here, is um, another one of my best mates, Chris Greensides. Yeah. You know, um, Chris couldn't make that trip when that picture were taken, but uh, Chris and I fished together. Basically, there was a club in Sheffield called Mercury Juniors, and I joined that when I was uh, 16. That was when I sort of decided to get into fishing in a big way. And um, Chris and I, he was fishing with a club at the time, and we became mates straight away sort of thing. And we used to go all over fishing like on the days when there weren't the club matches, either his mum would pick me up or my mum would pick him up and we'd somehow get a rod and whatever else to Dam Flask or Wire Mill Dam or Loxley Fisheries, somewhere around Sheffield, and we'd go fishing together. And we did it for, again, four four or five years we'd do that for. Mm. Um, and Chris, obviously, he's gone on to be a fantastic angler, fishes for Wales internationally now. Um, you know, he's really a more natural angler than me in many ways. You know, mm. and, and, and incredibly good angler, Chris. Yeah, incredibly yeah. good. He is um, and everything as well. He does a bit of everything. Yeah, he is. He's um, he's a proper natural, natural talent, isn't mm. he? Really. Mm. Um, so yeah. Um, but back in them days, there was no natural fishing. I, it was all commercial 
um, in the Sheffield area. The old lads used to talk fondly about the Trent as it used to be back in the day. You know, you can remember the old stories, can't yeah, you? Yeah, yeah. And now it wasn't proper fishing, all these commercials, mud pigs eat anything, like on the river. And I yeah. always remember this particular year we had a match. It was right at the end of the, of the year on the River Don. Now, I'd never fished a river on the, <laughs> on the pole in a match. I'd, I'd like pleasure fished rivers a few times with my dad when I was a, a kid. But I'd never fished a match on a river um, as an individual angler, you know, sort of thing. And uh, so we've gone on the Don and I'm paranoid about it. So all these, all I'd had all year off these lads, I'm winning the odd match on the commercials or framing. And they say, ah, we'll see how you go on up river at end at year, younger, and that'll sort you out. <laughs> <laughs> we'll, we'll see how good you are. <laughs> And I uh, always remember Stuart Haley, you know Stuart, mm. he used to have the, the butchers in Artill, didn't he? Yeah. Uh, he was very good on the Don, or everyone said he was. And, and, you know, I asked him, I said, what should I do? What should I do? And he said, oh, feed, feed six balls of ground, make a couple of men and run a pole rig over the top. And I, I, I can remember thinking, this is so awkward. It's so deep. I can't get, you know, I'd only got one top six for my pole and it was, it was dead a bit. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I caught six pounder roach and it was, I think I was fourth in the match. And I was buzzing because I think I was, I, you know, it, I did well anyway. And, yeah, yeah. Uh, I, I, I was fourth, and uh, remember thinking that like, come back with a cocky little teenager as I was then. Like that'll show you. Not not, not so bad at these rivers, am I? <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> but it was. It was all, all commercials and club fishing until, and uh, this is where you come into it. Really, um, you and I have been working together uh, a little bit before that, um, which we'll talk about later. But obviously, we started going fishing together. Um, and we were both at the perfect point then in our lives where we wanted to progress, weren't we? Really. Mm. Um, mm. And that started uh, some sort of mad journey of about the next 15 years. Didn't yeah, it, it went a bit <laughs> wild after that, didn't it? Well, there's a nice one of you two up there. I threw that up earlier. Ah, that was at the, that were the Oaks, wasn't it? When we yeah. went and fished against Josh and Ash, I think it were. It was head it? to head for the Angling Star, wasn't it? Yeah. yeah, it yeah. Was. And we won, I think. Yeah, we did. We did, I think. Well, did we take them somewhere as well, or did we never do round two because we beat them at there? That I think was... we won round one and made sure round two didn't happen, didn't we? Yeah, I think that that's what it. we did. Yeah, yeah, it's uh, yeah, that was um, that was on Alders Lake, I think. Yeah, Sesay at the Oaks at Sesay, and it was a head to head. Mine and Matt's combined weight versus them two, Ash Clements and Josh Newton. Yeah, I think Ash did win the match, but we yeah. beat them on combined weight. Didn't yeah, we? that's it. Yeah, Ash was an, a great angler, wasn't he? Phenomenal yeah. angler, yeah. yeah. Yeah, had some wild times with him as well, didn't we? Yeah. Yeah, I'm just looking at that thing. Um, I've got my Mozilla top on there and they did, you know, they, they were good to me in them days. Sponsored me when I was quite quite young, just getting into that open match yeah. fishing. Had a, we went uh, and stayed at, um, oh, what's he called? Vic, Vic's Vic house, house. Yeah. I went and stayed there the other week, actually. I was filming down there and I stayed with Vic again. Did you still got the fisher here? Yeah, Avalon, we did, some, did an open day there. Yeah. Cracking, yeah. cracking. Beautiful place, that is. Yeah, um, yes. You mentioned Angling Star. It's probably worth talking about. Obviously, the journey of your fishing adventure sort of came off the back of starting to work in the fishing industry as well. Yeah. How did how did that early part of work come about for you? Like getting into the fishing trade as such. Mm. You mentioned you had an English degree, used to work in English, started doing some writing. How did that come about? And obviously at the same time, it was running along with, we sort of met up and started going fishing as well. Yeah. Um. So basically, to tell the full story, I was doing my A-levels and the teacher said to us, you, to help your sort of portfolio or whatever it was, you, if you could get a piece of work published, that'd be great. So I thought, right, I like fishing. And I just caught this carp. Like eight, this is how basic I was at this point. I, I was about 15 or 16. And I remember catching an eight-pound carp, and that was the biggest carp I'd ever caught. Was, Where were that? A place called Hutchinson's Pond near Upton in Lincolnshire, right. where my granddad lived. And uh, I caught this carp, and uh, I wrote this piece for the Angling Star about catching my first carp, simple as that. Sent it off to Jim Baxter, who was the editor at the time. And he published it. Um, and he said, oh, I'd like to do some more for us, if you wouldn't mind. I thought, well, this is, this is great, you know, writing for a, a, a paper. So I started writing these these features every month for, for them. And career-wise, I'd never dreamed, really, I could work in fishing. It had always been, for me, I'll be a teacher, I'll, I'll do English, and then it'll be something in writing or, or teaching, English teacher maybe, sort of thing. Um, but as I went through my sixth form and then later my uni career, sort of thing, studying English at Sheffield Hallam, I thought, I wonder if I could make a career in angling journalism because Jim was publishing my work. He eventually started paying me a bit of money for doing mm -hmm. it. I met Keith Higginbottom, who was a um, a good friend and an angler in Woodseats AC, one of the clubs I mentioned. 
Keith, of course, was a former editor of the Anglin Times. Um, he edited the Anglin Times for eight years. Um, and he, at that point, was launching a company called Regional Anglin Magazines. And he took me on to do some work for them on a, a magazine called Northern Anglin Today. And I worked with, with Keith on that. He'd pay me a bit of money for like a day rate. I got all sorts of jobs, you know. I was like Del Boy at that age. I was working for Keith, working for Angling Star, working in a restaurant and working for a builder at one point. It was mad. Was Man to... of all trades. Yeah, that's Keith. And that's the first ever launch issue of Northern Angling today. That was in uh, about 2007, I think. Who was on the cover? I can't quite make it out. Can you, you remember? You know what? I... It was one of... There was something called the Don Valley Specimen Group, right? Yeah. And I got access to all these pictures... Um, that they would send through to me. And it was one of their guys with a big barbel. And right. It was a nice picture. Ah. Um, but I remember that was as that came off the press. And um, Keith, very kindly, I, I was actually Lord Editor of that. Although, you know, the title was Lord Editor. Keith did most of the work. He, he sort of mentored me through it. He was fantastic. Um, took me fishing. And again, you know, I was lucky to have him because he was... Very much out of our mould, Matt. Me and him, we'd do a day's work. We'd go for a couple of pints on the way home. <laughs> Every time. He was he, he was a proper bloke. He loved his match fishing, loved his fishing, loved a beer. Like, took me under his wing as a, you know, yeah. we had some great fun. Knew how to enjoy life. Oh, massively, massively. And it, and it just, but I always remember finishing uni, giving him a piece of work, thinking, I'm good at this English. I can write better than most people. I'm, mm. you know, jumped up little student twit or whatever you want to call me. Gave him this piece of copy, come back, just red pen all over it. I'm like, oh, I'm not that good then. <laughs> Gave it the what for sort of thing. Well, yeah, you know, and, and quite rightly, because you mm. write in a certain way that's too academic. I mean, w me and you had the same thing with people numerous times, haven't we, over the last few years? You did it with me for years. It's 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 easy to miss the point of saying, who you, well, who's your audience? Anglers, mm. well, don't write like you write in an essay for your tutor then. It's simple as that, isn't it? Mm. Um, but it does take some getting used to. Um, anyway, so yeah, worked for Keith for a few year, few months, unfortunately, um, full time, probably about two years in total before regional angling magazines went bust. Um, so I only had about four months full time work with him, and then all of a sudden, I was looking for a job, and that's when um, it's weirdly, weirdly enough, um, I thought to myself, "What can I do now?" And I was talking to a kid in the pub, and he was called Nick Rutter, another another angling friend through mm -hmm. one of the clubs. Uh, Great name. Yeah, it's how he works in Climax, in uh, Climax now, in oh, Island Direct in Sheffield. Yeah, yeah ah. Nick, I saw him the other week. And I was talking to him and I said, uh, yeah, I don't know what I'm going to do now. I have to get another job. And I was going for interviews, went for like, an interview with the AA of all people, actually. Tried to get the police. They wouldn't have me. I couldn't believe that. <laughs> I'm not surprised. <laughs> um, this all happened over like quite a short space of time, you know, three or four weeks. I'm trying never to get never to get a job, basically. And uh, Nick said, I've got a mate who'll help you out. I said, what do you mean? He said, well, he's just kidding. He's got a, um, got a website. Uh, called Fishing for Fun, and he wants to build it and make it better, and he runs a bathroom company. I'm like, this is a bit random. Went to meet this bloke over a beer in the pub, and he said, um, yeah, he says, come and work for me. I know what we'll do. You, if you just answer a few phone calls, and right, you can basically work on this website, write fishing content for me. I'll pay you, and while you're writing this content, um, just, just basically man the phone in the call centre sort of thing. What, selling a few bathrooms? Yeah, I'll just answer it, just basically answering questions of a database. It was easy. You Bit know. of a receptionist. Yeah, yeah. And so I did that. Brilliant, I thought. So <laughs> uh, so I, I did that for about four, 13, 14 months. And then you're going to think I'm a bit of a Jonah here, and it's probably true, because I mentioned regional angling magazines on a bit of a rocky time and went bust. Then Click Bathrooms, this company I was working for. <laughs> well, it's they not started... going well, is it? No, it's no, a common no. denominator there here is, somewhere. There is. <laughs> this, was, this sort of fell out. It wasn't a recession, I lad. It's all about getting the right people, isn't 2008, it? 2008, <laughs> big recession. You know, it, it, it was definitely that, not me. Uh, but it was on a bit. So I thought, oh, God, right, okay. Um, I better look for something else. Spoke to my old mate, Vic, who was sponsored me at that point. Vic Bush, as I mentioned. Said, do you fancy having a bit of a rep? Yeah, do, you, do you want me to try and sell a few bit of gear up your up this neck of the woods because there were nobody in. He said, yeah, go on, then have a go at that. So I had a go at that. And that was going well, actually. That was going quite well. Mm. But I always mentioned I wanted to be a journalist. And in this mad spell of applying for different jobs, I'd stuck in an application to a pole fishing magazine because I'd seen a job at DHP. And I really wanted it. I thought that would be amazing. If I could work, you know, the biggest, well, the second biggest publishing house in fishing, imagine. And uh, I, I, I got the job. Um, wow. So 
that then started that chapter. But I'm just going to stop there with that light train of thought because obviously we asked how it tied in with the fishing. And you all remember, while I worked for regional angling magazines in Northern Angling Today, I went out with this little ginger kid from South Sheffield who'd mm. just won his second Junior World Champs. He said, we well, go and do a feature with him. And I met him. And uh, we got on quite well, didn't we, pal? We got on quite well, mm. you know. Um, yeah, and I thought... I can remember you rocked up in your boss's car, I think. Yeah, Keith's car it was. Yeah. Keith in Mottam's car. Yeah. Because yeah, I couldn't... I hadn't got a car. And... Um, yeah, I actually got you. You did a bit of work for me, didn't you? Helped me with it. Mm. I thought he's quite switched on this. Like, little did I know, I should never have got involved. But anyway, <laughs> <laughs> um, you did some match reports for me, didn't you? And yeah. Did writing, and then obviously, as I said, Northern Angling Today went, or Regional Angling Magazines went bust, and, and I, I owed you a bit of money for some of the work you'd done. I think mm. I owed you sixty quid from memory. I know. I was thinking about getting the big men round. I know. <laughs> I know. I thought that. So I thought, right. Um, so I rung you up. And said, Matt, you fancy a, a pint? I'll bring you that money. And this was like New Year's time, was it? We're over Christmas, definitely, yeah. Because yeah. I got my first car, I always remember, on Christmas Eve. Mm. We went for a pint on New Year's Eve or New Year's Day. Yeah. And basically, I, I'd decided, after sort of reaching that point in my club fishing career, I think I'd won the last two, little, I'd won a couple of the leagues anyway, and, and Mark Holmes had had this chat with me and said, look, you need to push yourself a bit. I want to go open fishing. I said to you, fancy going open match fishing. I've just got a car. Do you fancy coming with me? And you said, yeah. I'd never really been open match fishing. Not no. outside fishing Aston Ponds next to me door. Yeah, yeah. And so that began the journey, didn't it, really? Mm. Um, and it was just, well, I think um, I look back on it, it, it doesn't seem that long ago, even though it is, does it? It's How long ago is that now? Well, I was, I think I was 22. I must have been 17, 18. Might, I might have been 21 then. You were like 16, 17, weren't you? Yeah. Well, I, remember yeah. We, I remember having to smuggle you into bars and nightclubs. No, I was definitely 17 because we got kicked out of that nightclub in Yarm, didn't we? We got kicked out of a few nightclubs, Yeah. But yeah. anyway, I remember. I don't know if I can tell. Toby, you might have to edit this out. You might be able to leave it. <laughs> you might be able to leave it. I can remember. So this is probably only the second or third time we've been fishing together. So we had this thing, right. I'd pick you up on a Saturday morning. We'd go on yeah. a match. We'd stop at my house or your house. Mm -hmm. We'd go out, yeah, on have a few pints, and then we'd go fishing the second on the second day, Sunday. Sunday, um, and we went out in Sheffield on the Saturday night. Mm -hmm. a few different bars, few ciders, and I thought so I'd never really been drinking with you before, and I thought, well, it seems all right. We Jen. went out first with them lot with wood seats, lads. We went in White Lion. We did. We went in White Lion with them. We did. We had a few in there, and then uh, old Matt Oldfield says, "Come on, we'll go for a couple up West Street." So we went up West Street. And uh, I always remember, it might just collapsed, and, and I'm like, I'm like, God, what properly? Oh, oh God, God. laid on curb, and I'm stood there thinking, I'm just, I laid him down on curb, and I'm stood with him thinking what to do next, and police have come. No. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And they said, if you don't get him up, we'll nick him. <laughs> no. So I'm thinking to myself, you would not do well in a cell either. Would you? Oh, no, it'd be <laughs> no good for me. Yeah. Like, I was more thinking I wouldn't do well if his mum and dad found out. <laughs> <laughs> So I've picked him up and we've got him home and he puked up all over the dining room uh, floor at my mother, mother's house. And, uh, she didn't mind one bit, did she? Bless oh, her. Funny that was. And then the next day, I always never remember. met his mum before either. You well, had. That'll, that'll break the ice. <laughs> <laughs> you had met her before, I think, once or twice. But anyway, I remember that. Then the next day, you're doing all right in the match. You're second, and I just see Matt walk up the bank halfway through the match at Wetlands. Mm. He's come back with his bag. I'm thinking, what's he doing? Next thing, he's come down to me peg and he's washing his shirt, trying to get the sick out of his shirt so his mum didn't know he'd been drinking. <laughs> yeah, that's what I was doing. Like, I remember we were on them boards at Wetlands. Yeah. And I'd got me like best white shirt on and I'd got chunks in it oh. from night. <laughs> and my mum and dad were picking me up from Wetlands that night. And that was it. I, I can remember dipping it in edge and then I hung all my clothes out behind me peg to dry out. Didn't have to get yeah. all sick off them. Did yeah. they find out? Well, they have done now, haven't they, for listening to this? <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, oh, brilliant. We had the best few years, didn't we? I mean, oh, gosh, phenomenal. It was, at that age, it was all, all new to us, wasn't it? I mean, travelling around different fisheries. Um, and, and, you know, we were talking about it earlier when we were planning it, weren't we? We seemed to win quite a lot of things back then. Like, it seemed, I don't know whether it was or it's our perceptions, but fishing mm. seemed, commercial fishing seemed easier, didn't it? We just seemed to turn up at places and seemed to do well. Mm. Definitely. Um, Definitely. I think you, you touched on it earlier. I think the standard of commercial fishing now is significantly higher than it 
ever has been yeah. ever before, which, you know, give, I've got so much respect for the people that do consistently well in it. Your Bennett's, your Christian's, Jamie's, to name the mm. normal few that we talk about. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it definitely used to seem to be able to move about different ones and win more. Yeah. Um, sort of 10 to 15 years ago. 100%. Much more than you can now. 100%. It, um, but yeah, I mean, there was that adventure. And then I, I remember the thing that sort of changed it for me. I, I mentioned I got this aspiration as a as a youngster to be an all-round angler. Mm. And um, there, there was, in your fishing, a lot more natural venue knowledge because you've obviously done your international thing. Um, you'd fished a few trials on venues in the UK and junior nationals and things like that, hadn't you? Mm. you you'd, de you'd definitely got more knowledge. And the opportunity came, I think, actually, as you and I started knocking about to each, uh, with each other, you were fishing the thorn pairs with Brian Hawkes, weren't you? And I said, yeah. I think you won a match, didn't you? With about remember. six pounds, you remember? It were eight pounds somewhere off their end peg on West Street. I can remember it. I went next to Mark Wainwright, yeah. I always remember you, you, you ringing me and saying, I won, I won today. Anyway, um, so the following year, he said, you ought to come on the stay and give it a go. And mm. and it was that year, that canal scene just exploded, didn't it? It was like... There were nobody going on it for a few years, were there? And then it fished really well that year you fished it. I might have my timeline a, a year or two out, but mm. I seem to remember whether we did one year at Lindome or two, because we went on the Winter, winter, league, winter league there. But the Stainy, just Joe Carras and Lee Carey were fishing it, and it was great, wasn't it? And we're like, right, we need to be on that next year. Mm -hmm. And that was a, probably the steepest learning curve I've ever had to do Yeah, going on there. Um, from doing quite well on commercials, um, albeit at an open match level, you know, I wasn't, I wasn't, it wasn't like it is now, was it? It was different. Um, they were big matches, Tom. Them as well, like <clears> touching <throat> on it. They were they were hundred peg matches, eighty peg, two hundred peg matches, and people used to travel from all over the country oh, to fish yeah. them. Yeah, it, I remember. I think the first match I ever fished on there, um, I drew opposite Blue Water Marina about the one eighties or something mm -hmm. like that. And I've got Paul Hughes, a couple of pegs to my right. He fished a long whip and yeah. caught 17 pound erosion, a long whip. Uh, Frankie were next to him. Frankie was only a little kid then, wasn't he? Yeah. Uh, he caught, I can't remember, another big weight though. I think he did well, 14 pound. All the way through, it was just these huge weights. And uh, I think I limped home with about seven pound. I've never <laughs> done it before. And I thought, gosh, I've got some mountains to climb here. Um, but what a... What an arena to learn that was. It was mm. just great, wasn't it, really? What did it teach you? What did fishing that circuit, that big canal, the Stainforth and Keed, be thorn in the winter? What did it teach you that sort of set you in such good stead? I think, um, first and foremost, the first lesson that, that, that was really hard-hitting sort of thing was I got so much to, so much to learn. Mm. So, like... In that first year, one of those one of those matches, I drew in between Alan Scothorn and Sean Ashby, and I've caught a fisher chuck all day, or so I thought. But this is how far behind I must have been. You know, I remember I think I weighed like three twelve, mm. and I honestly thought, uh, well, they might have a bit more than me, but I've I've kept up with them too. Really, no, they're ten pound each of them either side of me, ten pound. I'm like, ooh. I'm not very good at this then. <laughs> but, I mean, you helped me a lot. Joe Carras was the man on there at that time. If you remember, he was winning. He was probably the best angler at Thorne. I think he was, definitely, yeah, at in, that time. In those early years, he helped me a lot. And and it took me a long time, probably four or five months. Of, there's Joe. There's Joe, bless him. That were on his wedding, I think. That it were was. his wedding. It was. I'll tell you what, they don't look very happy in the background, do they? They don't, We do have they? just upset them, haven't we? But anyway, um, yeah, it took me a long time. Uh to get, you know, five, four or five months of, of fishing through that winter. And I remember, always remember winning my first section on there. Mm -hmm. And uh, I even tied for that with Dave Brooks Jr., me and him on, on the flats tied, and we had like a little bit, a big 11 pound. And, and I was so happy because it had been such a fast learning curve and such a um, steep learning curve, really. I mean, there were nowhere to hide. It was mega fair. You all remember how fair it was. It was probably the fairest venue I've ever fished that canal. Mm. at that time when it was bloodworm fishing i'd agree um and like so you could if you got the little things right if you got the right quantity of ground bait and soil the right amount of joker in your initial feed you topped up correctly you got the right rigs and obviously so blessed to have you joe these people to call on to get this information but i quite quickly felt i went from not really well being awful no i'm not going to say not really competing it weren't that it was just just dreadful to 
competing, you know? Mm. Um, and even, you know, we fished it for, what, four or five years after that. And I never, I wouldn't say I ever shone there. I, I never was like a, it was to me, the, the best anglers at Thorn were yourself, first and foremost. I've taken over that full time. I'd say you were the best. Lee Kerry was brilliant as well, probably not far behind you. Um, Joe had stopped coming after a while. Obviously, he was very good when he went. Um, Alan, another one, you know, brilliant. His record there was was really good, although he had a couple of bad years towards the end of it, didn't he? Mm. Um, but, you know, you could see the class of angler who internationals shone on there. Um, but I was proud to be part of the chasing pack by the end of it. You know, I was... Mm. Uh, I won money most matches, I'd say. You went, me and Lee won the teams of three, didn't we, one year? Mm -hmm. um, you know, obviously carried by two fantastic guys. I was like the donkey, you two were like the shy horses, yeah, but never mind. Um, but yeah, you know, it, I got to a level where I was competing and that gave me an awful lot of confidence because coming off the back of that time on the Staley, I knew that on small fish, unless I've got Matt Godfrey in the section or Alan Scothorn, I'm probably going to do really well. Mm. Um, and that, to take that into natural venue fishing everywhere else, was a, a sort of major confidence boost, if that makes sense. Mm. I think listening in there, mate, though, like what you said, you summed it up when you mentioned the four to five year period. That wasn't a small, short learning experience. You didn't go on the canal for a winter and suddenly learn bloodworm fishing. No. Four or five years. And that's a big commitment in your fishing to go, I'm going to keep doing this. I'm going to get better at that. And yeah. I almost feel like not that many anglers would be willing to do that nowadays, you know, actually thinking about it. I totally agree. And, and, and you know, there's no there's no denying the fact in, in my mind, I am not a natural angler. I have to work really hard at everything. Mm. By this, you know, to give you a comparison, Denty, right? Now, Denty and me, Fish Thorn. James Dent. Yeah, James Dent, Fish Thorn, for the first time on the first day. Like, we, we the first match there... That I fished was the first match he fished. Yeah. I remember this. And it took him, I'd say it took me up, I'd say we fished it four or five years. I think it probably took me two years to get reasonably good. <laughs> took Denty about three matches. And he yeah. was, oh, here we are, 14 pound of ropes later. <laughs> and that's that's the difference, isn't it? You know, yeah. Denty, there he is. Look, he, he's just the most natural you'll ever meet, isn't he, really? Yeah, phenomenal. Um, and, 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 and so for me, it was a lot of work. Um, but I was really proud to get there. And that confidence then translates into other fishing. So, for mm. example, um, when I w went down on the Norfolk Rivers, I knew that if, if there was a bit of roach fishing, if I could get my head into it, I'd do well at it. Likewise, on the Y, if it's a bit of time and motion type fishing, I can do that. That's one ticked off the list of, I'm not a master of it, and you've obviously got to constantly work at your fishing and apply your skills to the venue and learn. But it's there, isn't it? It's... Mm. Um, I put the work in, I've got the skill set, and I can then tweak and hone it and develop it, really. Mm. And I, I think what you, well, that, that kind of fishing and the way you described it there, like the quantities of soil and ground bait you used to have to feed, the amount of joker that was in your peg, the having the right rig, that, that kind of fishing that you did over that period teaches you the key concepts. And even though that's bloodworm fishing for roach on a canal... You could apply that to F1 fishing. How many micros am I going to tap in? And is my rig ripe for it? And how often do I need to feed? And when do I need to come off a line to rest it? Like the, you, you learn in that period, I think, the concepts that mattered, the mechanics of fishing. Yeah. I yeah. have this conversation so many times with um, Lee, Kerry, or Denty when we're away on international duty. The number of times we come back and reference that little time period we had on that canal. It were a little golden age yes. of fishing. And I, I honestly think that bred a, a real good little generation of anglers that will take what they learnt there yeah. and apply it for the rest of their life. Yeah, I, I think as well, um, I was talking to... Oh, who was I was talking to? Uh, Richard Chapman, actually. Richard yeah. Chapman, on the, me and him drew next to each other. And we're talking about how good it is when you get a pod of really competitive anglers all fishing the same venue. Yes. Right? Because that pushes the standard to a ridiculous level, yes. doesn't it? And that's what happened at Thorn over mm -hmm. that spell. It was it was ridiculously hard to do well. It was like, mm. you know, it was the highest. I suppose you were all at an age as well. You were, you were like 22, 23, 24. Mm. Lee would have been 30, probably, 28, 29, 30, yeah, that sort of age. He was probably nearer 40, wasn't yeah, he? Yeah, he was. What is he now? He must be 50 now, Lee, is he? Alan was in his prime. Sean Ashby was in his prime. Cam Hughes were coming up. 
you know, we got this hotbed. I and mean, because it was fair and level, and everyone knew that, there was mm. nowhere to hide, were there? No. It was awesome. Awesome. Yeah, yeah, it was, it was. I wish we could go back to them days. It was so good. Yeah, I do, mate. I do. It's got me uh, It's got me thinking. We should run some on the canal again, maybe. We, we, we maybe should. We're not running matches though, anymore, are we? No, we've been through that part. Unless events. we can take at least a grand each admin fee. Yes. And, um, yeah. No coverage. No, just, just admin. <laughs> <laughs> um, I was going to say something else about the canal and Thorn, and I can't remember what it was. I think, oh, one thing I will say is, for me, I, I mean, I did good on the canal and I enjoyed it. But for me, it was there was one conversation that changed it all for me. And I've got to mention it because I only mm. think it's fair. But it was when we had the Winter League semi-final on there. Um, and it was Joe Carras and Lee Kerry, and Lee in particular, who probably led the conversation. Mm. And those two were doing really well mm. one year. And because we had a team event on there... Mm. Um, we had a team meeting and they basically said, look, there's these three or four little things that are making a massive difference. Mm. And I think we won something stupid like eight out of 10 sections and two seconds on yeah. on the Winter League final. And I, I always have a lot of respect for Lee um, and Joe for giving that away to the team because I think that they sort of really passed on information that would cost them in the mm. future. Yeah. And, and that were a really... Um, key moment for me when they sort of said that I remember it was simple things like how positive the rigs were yeah shorter hook lengths the right hook hooking joker instead of blood worm yeah how rich the top up mix was with joker yeah and they literally went look we've had a few good years at this this is what we need to do gang yeah and we had this amazing winter league semi one but they definitely gave away a yeah. lot that would cost them in the next few years in that one conversation. Yeah, yeah, and and, and to be fair, that's um, and that that I mean at that point, like Barnsley, it was, it was the very beginning, I'd say, of of what's been an era of domination for Barnsley, and it wasn't it. Mm. Um, at that point, there was still you know I think Trentman had won the semi final the year before at Woodlands. I think I just joined Trentman at that point, um, so it wasn't like you'd got it. Like you've got it now, where you win everything. It's like it was. There were a few teams knocking on your door, weren't there? Definitely. Um, I think Shakespeare did really well that year. Yeah. On the canal, yeah. Yeah, it, uh, it wasn't uh, as cut and dry as it is anymore, no. was it? It was. It was. It was interesting, but that was the beginnings of it, mm. wasn't it? Really. A after After Thorn, after that, I mean, what other sort of um, arenas and kind of fishing did you throw yourself into? Following that, how did you apply everything that you'd learnt there going well, forward? I think as well, alongside the Thorn, as you, as you remember, Thorn was a Sunday match normally for us, wasn't it? We had individual league before Christmas, pair of Thorn pairs we used to fish after Christmas. But on the Saturdays, there was um, a league on the Fosdyke. And I was lucky enough, one of my first features working for DHP was with Rob Perkins, who again, I'd never met before at this point. Uncle Pine Top. Yeah, and we went on the Fosdyke and... Me and him just hit it off straight away. Like, I said how well you and me hit it off. It was the same with Rob. It was like, I like this bloke. He got a great pat lunch. I remember that much. <laughs> um, he just spoke my language, you know. He did. Um, Pork pies, brown sauce. Oh, we had it all, mate. We sat down. We had a lovely day out. And uh, he caught uh, a big bream and some perch. And it was just a great day. And uh, he said to me, oh, take me a number. And if you want to, I'll try and do his accent. I can't do it. If you want to pick my brains, you can do. Give me, give me a ring. So I did. I bet he wished he never said that because I <laughs> used to pester him. And Rob, of course, at that point, still is one of the best all rounders in the country. But he just won the knockout cup a couple of years before. Um, he was, you know, I was in awe of the bloke. To be fair, because he was at that point in his in his fishing when he was one of the men to beat the Fosdyke every time I went. He'd do brilliant. Um, and he taught me loads, Matt. He taught me absolutely loads. And, and the good thing was. On the one hand, obviously, on the Sundays, I've got your international experience and and the advantage of talking to you a lot about bloodworm fishing and all that. Rob approaches his fishing very differently, but in a way that's very useful to me because it's much more about... He's an option coverer, Rob, but mm. he, takes, he, do, he, he takes chances. He likes a bonus fish line. He likes a... He'll work his peg, and he knows how to win. He knows how to, like, catch big fish and... Mm. You know, and, and, and to have the two kinds of things feeding into my experience was, was massive. So I'm fishing the Foz Dyke on a Saturday, along with you. You, you started at UK with me, didn't you? We loved it. Did. Loved the Foz. We had, uh, but like, I used to talk to Rob a lot. I, Rob asked me to join Trentman. He was captain then, and I joined Trentman. And uh, I had a brilliant time fishing with them lads. Um, 
but it was good because it gave me two different kinds of experience. So mm. I was talking to you on the one hand and him, him on the other, and uh, and it, it, you know he's just been such a big influence on me fishing. I can't really thank him enough. Um, so the Fosdyke was the other venue we fished, um, mm. and then after that, I seem to remember what happened was Dave Harrell said to me, "You want to try going to Evesham." <laughs> I thought, why the hell would I want to go to Evesham? I've seen the results at Evesham. It looks absolutely shocking. That's the Warwickshire Avon. Yes, yes, the Warwickshire Avon. And basically what happens on the Warwickshire Avon is there's a series of qualifying matches between June the 16th and the August bank holiday. And you have to win a 20 or 25 peg zone to qualify for the final. And it's a big money final. I mean, it is it. About twenty grand paid out over the three days. It's yeah, big the... festival, loads of hype. Yeah, other than Riverfest, it was the biggest money thing in river fishing, isn't mm. it, really? Um, so I said to you, do you fancy going to Evesham? And this was opening weekend or the weekend after, wasn't it? Yeah. So off we went. Tipped up, didn't we, pal? Yeah. And never uh, been before. Never been Never be- seen it before. First few day, first first day, we didn't catch a lot. Second day, though, I think you won the match with some eels. I did. Do you remember? Yeah. Eight no, pounds that's, summer. Sorry, sorry, we've got to tell the story. Right, so so <laughs> this is what happened. So this first day, so Dave Harrell said to her, it's hard and you have to do, you know, just scratch about four pound can be a good weight, five pound can be a good weight. It's hard fishing. <clears throat> right, okay. So me and him have tipped, I've told all this to Matt and we've relayed it all and we've gone and we've had a go and we've, neither of us have caught a lot on first day. And, and where they do the payout at Evesham is Hampton Ferry. So it's like a lovely cafe next to the river the bar in it and everything great place God, to say, it's how, say how bad we thought the fishing were we I mean yeah first day we were loving evesham were we? but and just don't forget as well i'm going to say now so we've been told all this and we've been fishing faffy pinky rigs and hemp rigs come back down saw my old mate colin perry on the ferry how have we gone on 50 pound cock all right have you caught them corn on ground bait <laughs> and corn <laughs> And he caught, didn't he? He caught fifty pound bream on corn on the ferry on sixty four or yeah. sixty five peg. Yeah. Do you remember? Yeah. And that lad next to him had a big, had forty pound or something, yeah. didn't he? And there's and Matt's like, you told me it were it were hard hemp fishing and hard pink. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, the day after it was, he won me about eight pound. Yeah, he? got some eels on a flat flow. <laughs> And um, we discovered the light, nightlife of Evesham, I think, somewhere oh in between, word. didn't we? Marilyn's. Now, there's yeah. a spot. Yeah, Marilyn's nightclub. There used to be this nightclub, Tobes. You'd have loved it. Middle of Evesham. And it's quite a, um, it's quite a weird place, isn't it? Yeah. What, what makes it weird? It's local, I think, probably. Yeah, it, it's just a, like, you know, when you get... It's not weird. I don't think it's weird. I think, I'll tell you what I think. I think it's like, you know, one of these places, like, where there's not a lot else to do but drink, so they all drink. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Mm. They all love a beer. And the pubs and bars and, uh, are absolutely rabbit, aren't oh, they? Oh, great. And we just fitted in, like, uh, like yeah, hand into a glove, mm. didn't we? Mm. Just, and uh, I also remember, booked this quite a posh... We didn't really know where to stay, so we booked this guest house, quite posh. <laughs> and... Uh, Ed again, Warren. again, I'm not going to talk about that. I want to talk about the other thing that you did. They got us barred. <laughs> <laughs> I can't remember that. What was it? So we've been out on this night out. Got locked out, didn't I? Well, the one I'm on about, I've gone upstairs. He's behind me. You, you've come out of the taxi behind me. Oh, I've gone yeah. into the room. I think it matters a long time. Next thing you've come in looking a bit sheepish. You've mm. got in, might have gone into the wrong room and got in bed with a couple in bed. Yeah. <laughs> accidentally. <laughs> Accidentally. Yeah. So yeah. Then we've gone down for breakfast. How did, how did the, the, hang on, how did that go down? Not very well. <laughs> it was this lovely guest house, Tob. It was beautiful. It was like on the back of a farm, wasn't it? Yeah. I'm yeah. sorry, Tob. I'm not going to let you go past that because I want, like. No, I can remember. I tell you, it was the same night. Ed were there, Ed Warren, and we'd been out. I don't think it was. I'm I sure think... it were me and Ed, and you'd got back. We had to get two separate taxis. And I think you'd gone back and we'd followed and you'd obviously gone to the room and I'd gone to what I thought was the room. <laughs> and it was um, it was a couple on the honeymoon. Brilliant. And they was. were in honeymoon suite. And I remember going... Did you actually get into the bed? I, w- I nearly did, yeah. They were obviously awake, live and kicking when I tried to... <laughs> the, the thing was that made it so funny to me, right? So breakfast time the next morning. Mm. She, to be honest, I was glad because she was a miserable... She was one of them. I thought to myself, why do you work in hospitality anyway? You're miserable anyway. Yeah, I don't like yeah, her very yeah. much. And Matt will tell you, I don't have my feelings very well with stuff like that. So <laughs> I wasn't impressed anyway. So and she, we've had some complaints. So have you? What's, what, what's happened? Your ginger friend, the ginger one. <laughs> Fair hair, I think she said. Yeah. Anyway, so we were barred. Anyway, <laughs> right, this gets funnier, this does. Because little did I know 
that so we're barred from one guest house, <laughs> right? There's another there's another guest house. I forgot about this. Right, round the corner. And <laughs> I didn't realise it's owned by the same family. Like this is the daughter who was in the one we're barred oh, from so already. So the same owners in a owner. So <laughs> yeah, one's like say grandma. Well, Elderly couple in the 60s owned the second one we booked in the week after. Mm. And the first <laughs> one's owned by someone else. So we've gone out the week after. And, uh, we had a few beers again and one thing led to another. And all we of got, a sudden is this the one where we got Frankie with us? No, it's the third one. Oh, we'll, right. we'll have to go on to that. The second one was, um, you, yeah, you have to beat the name out, Toes, but Hazler Farm. Hazler Farm. What did we do there? So basically we couldn't get in. Yeah. And uh, I climbed through the... <laughs> Um, I well, we couldn't. We, we'd lost the key, <laughs> and I climbed through the kitchen window because the, the the window was half open. So I've like thought, well, I'll, I'll climb in and I'll go and open the door. So I'm halfway through the window, and obviously lights come on. This old couple's come down. Oh gosh, here we go again, round two. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, it's a uh, mystery, we're, you were barred. Yeah, we're barred from that one as well. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, and then was the one that Frankie got barred for. That's another story. That were a great, that were a weird night. That one, wasn't it? Is that podcast friendly? That one, I think so. It, yeah, well, come on, you got to do all three. So, um, well, actually, yeah, this third one for some reason, I, I think there were me, you, Denty, Denty Frankie, and somebody else. Was it Josh? Um, Josh Newton? Or no, Ash? no, it was. I was with them not that long ago. And I can't remember who it was. There was someone else there. Not Rob Wright. No, that were a different night. Anyway, we're in Evesham. Yeah. And we've gone out, right? And Went oh. to Weatherspoons were the starting point, wasn't it? Always started in Weatherspoons <laughs> and then worked his way around. Yeah. And we ended up in this little nightclub on a corner. Well, no, we met these girls and they said, why don't you come to this place with us? Yeah. And it was like a backstreet weird club. <laughs> yeah. I remember following them there thinking... This I liked looks it, a bit me. Dodgy. I thought it looked good. Like. I thought it looked quite, <laughs> quite naughty. I thought. It no. was, well, anyway, yeah. Anyway, you're going to tell it. You tell it. You, know, you tell it. Right. So, anyway, we're in there. And uh, Frankie's just turned into matchmaker. Somebody must have spiked him with a drink with something because it was the weirdest thing ever. He's just basically going around. So, imagine this odd bloke, an odd woman on the dance floor in this little place. And he's grabbing a bloke. I just right. thought I'd throw that up for the story. There he is. There he is. <laughs> he's grabbing a bloke. That's when a bird shat on his face. Like a stag do, that is. That was, um, that was in Newcastle, I think. Um, oh, no. What, was it Liverpool or Newcastle? Wait, Crouchy's stag do. Yeah, Newcastle. Crouchy Stag Newcastle. Newcastle, that, yeah. Different um, story. Anyway, so he's getting hold of a bloke's hand, dragging a bloke towards, towards him, grabbing hold of a woman and pushing them together and making them dance. <laughs> like serenading them, Yeah, why? then he'd move on to the next one. Say, and I kept going up to Frankie, you're going to get knocked out. Come with me. <laughs> Come and sit down. No, I've got to do this. Tom, you know what he's like when he gets to Tom, I've got to do this. I've got to do it. And he's really serious about what he's doing. So I says, I don't know what I'm going to do. And uh, anyway, fortunately, eventually, he gave up, didn't he? Mm. Um, mm. But you tell the second part, because uh, you had to sleep in the same room as him. I was in a separate room, one, unfortunately. Well, we got up the next morning. This is a, this is the third guest house in Evesham. <laughs> um, and I went to the toilet and met Tom on the landing, I think I did. Yeah. And Tom's gone to me. He says, listen, we've got a problem. And I, at this point, I've just opened my eyes. We've had a bit of a wild night out. And Tom said to me, um, we've got this problem. And I'm thinking, oh, dear, what is it? And he says, here, come and look at this. And he took me into the bathroom, right? And every toilet roll that you can imagine, <laughs> I can see it vividly now. <laughs> some Someone had coming. got, <laughs> yeah. not, not toilet roll off the roll, just rolls of toilet roll in the toilet covered in vomit. No. Right. And Tom, and I never, we didn't speak. He opened this toilet door and showed it me and there's sick everywhere, right? And this trail of sick came out of the toilet. I swear to God, <laughs> it, it was a constant line of sick. No. And it's come out of the toilet, gone down the side of the toilet, out of the door, along the landing. Lovely guest house, by the <laughs> way. Along the landing. How long was this trail? Uh, up. You know, from me to you along this landing. Yeah. And there's an odd little pool in between where there's obviously it's been just, a... Oh, no. A, and it's gone up the door, and then there's a nice smear around the door handle. Oh. It was like a scene out of a horror film. <laughs> tried to get right? it in. 
And then we've reluctantly opened this door. There's another pool just inside, and the little trail went up the side of the bed and into the corner of the mouth of Frankie laid in bed. <laughs> oh, no. And I, 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 I remember you just saying to me, we just need to go. <laughs> That's what you said. You, yeah. you went, I says, what do you think we should do? And you said, I think we should just go. Well, what else could we do? We it, couldn't. We couldn't do a lot, could we? No. Um, so we went. And I think Frankie had a great day's fishing the next day, didn't he? Right, so he drew, drew next to me. And uh, <laughs> look, I caught some eels. I think I was third in the match. We had a four pound, big four pound of eels. And uh, Frankie come down about two o'clock and says, uh, I'm going to have a fish. Let's go on then. And uh, he gets his rod out, chucks it out, hooks a barbel, which would have won him the match, lost mm. it and packed up. <laughs> 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 that was him. <laughs> oh, it was great, wasn't it? Yeah, very good. Fun uh, fun and frolics. It did probably teach us quite a bit about fishing, though, Evesham. Definitely. It, yeah, absolutely. <clears throat> I, I'll... I still love the fishing there, me. And I know it's not everyone's cup of tea, um, mm. but it's been very kind to me over the years. It's it's um, it's the ultimate decision making place, isn't it? Because mm. you can, I mean, our third two years ago with a big three pound, of, you know, eighty peg final, three pound odd. If it can be like that on other days, you need, you know. Twenty pound, yeah. Don't you? Twenty pound a chub, forty pound of skimmers and bream. Yeah. Ten pound of eels or a big fish can yeah. win it. Yeah. I mean, you have actually won the Witchhaven there. Yeah, I won the Witchhaven to two thousand and nineteen. I think it was caught a barbel. Um, that was that was good. That was one of them days when I basically said to myself, um, I think "In fact, there's a good." That's, stu- that's it, there, isn't it? That's the one. Yeah, that was him. Worth a few quid. And in the background, you can see Adrian Whittle there, right? Now, there's a funny story about this. I've got Adrian Whittle one side and Jamie Robbins the other. The two better, I would rate the two, well, two of the top, well, two of the best river anglers in the country. Mm. I'll just say that. Awesome. And Adrian, and he's like me, he likes a bit of banter. And he said to me in the morning, he said, I'm really glad I'm next to you today, Tom. <laughs> anyway, as you know, Adrian's been a big mentor over the years to Rory Jones. And me and Rory had been barbel fishing a couple of days before that final. We caught a load of barbel on meat. There's a video on Catchwork, so you can watch what we made that day. Nice. And uh, so I thought, you know what? I'm going to fish out. That's a barbel area where I drew. I thought, I'm going to have half the day fishing for small fish. If I can't catch them, I'm just going to chuck a lump of meat and try and win it with a big fish because I think that's what you'll need And uh, on the meat. So lo and behold, it's gone over, hasn't it? Four hours in, I've had that barbel. Nice. <laughs> And Ad and Jamie are struggling a bit, so I've, uh, I've shouted down to Ad. I'm so glad, mate. Well, what do you mean? I'm so glad I'm next to you today. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, no, it was uh, it was a, that was a good day. Nice one to win, though. And I know you say like you just chucked a piece of meat out and caught this big barbel, but that's the kind of decision making that wins big finals on natural venues yeah. undoubtedly yeah it does and and you know for too many years and i think maybe that's where the thorn thing worked against me a little bit because mm. i've got experience of small fish fishing at evesham sometimes i was guilty of trying to catch small fish when i should have gone for it you know because yes you can winkle out three or four pound win your section and which i have done at evesham a few times in the finals but what good does that really do you yeah i've caught four pound 12 mm. i've 100 quid or 200 quid or whatever it is but I've never given myself a chance of winning. And mm. that was a lesson I've learnt probably around that time. And they only do it once, and now I think like that a lot more often. And mm. it works, doesn't it, when you do it? You know, it, 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 it it's playing the game, but once you've got that confidence that occasionally it does work, you do it. Will talks about it a lot, doesn't he? I think it was in his podcast or somewhere I read Game Changing Fish, mm-hmm. Match Changing Fish, and it stuck with me that. I thought, hmm, he's, he's dead right. Mm, it's a mindset thing, isn't it? Yeah, definitely a mindset thing. Give yourself a chance. I mean, how many people have won the section off a nice peg when taking a bit of a risk? They might have won the match. That's, well, I think I've definitely did that at Evesham in the past, you know. Mm. Um, but yeah, it, it's uh, it's good. It's it's been a brilliant arena, and I missed it this year. I, I've I've gone a different route with my fishing this year, which we'll talk about. Um, but there's no denying I, I have missed Evesham. Mm. Interesting. Um, I think that everything we've talked about in your fishing so far has been very natural venue based, which is interesting. But I know you've done a, an awful lot of commercial fishing, um, as well. Ha- and and that sort of led to the all roundness of your fishing that you first mentioned. You wanted to be this all rounder. You looked at people like your Coxes, John Arthur, Will Raisin, aspired to be all round. 
we've talked a lot about natural fishing. What kind of commercial fishing did you do to gain that experience? Well, um, I mean, the year followed a bit of a pattern, didn't it? Um, once you and I were fishing together, it was very much the winter we'd fish the Fosdark, Staney. Spring into summer we'd go commercial fishing. So, so from about March to um, June, we'd literally fish commercials really heavily, wouldn't we? Um, mm. And then June onwards, we'd normally go on the rivers, and that was pretty much how we did things. And the year always started for us on commercials by going to White Acres, which and I've been to White Acres for years, and. I remember when I first went, just being, again, totally in awe of the place and the anglers you met down there. Um, like, you know, and, and the learning curve, you know, I always remember, weirdly enough, um, what the first time I went, the like, first time I went, it was with some uh, Matt Oldfield and Paul Gorman, two, two mates from the club. But the second time, I booked to go down with the lad. And uh, I was going to go for two weeks. I was working for Keith at the time. Mm. And this lad let me down. He couldn't go. So I had to go on my own. So I'm only like... 21 all right, and I've got two weeks booked at White because in a caravan on my own I'm fishing the Maver Festival and the Preston Festival and I thought to myself right this is going to be daunting but I went took my mum's car down so I don't got a car at the time <laughs> this lad was meant to be taking me in his van so I borrowed her car got on the insurance it's a little Suzuki Swift off I went nice and, uh, yeah and and the first fr I got there on the Saturday and like right, I knew Stuart Lister quite well because uh, I'd befriended him on the festival before, um, and, and a kid called Dave Schofield who I bumped into and got scuba. Yeah, I ended up stopping with him, which were great. I got a bit of a refund off, off my caravan. Um, but this Saturday night, I thought I'll go for a pint in the bar, and uh, I also remember I bumped into Dean Barlow. Didn't know who Dean Barlow was. Um, didn't know anybody was really like other than the odd sort of really famous person from the magazines. Uh, Richie Hull, he were there, mm -hmm. and. Uh, Anyway, we've gone out nightclubbing. And Rooney, I think Rooney were there. I think it was Rooney, who I didn't know. Dean and Richie. Anyway, we've gone into Newquay. And uh, anyway, we've had a few pints. And, and this lad, he's eyeing me up for a fight. And I'm thinking, I don't, I've never had a fight in my life. I'm the, the least fighting person ever. I, it's not, not for me. Why is he eyeing you up, though? He's, Did I you think, provoke him? I don't think so. I mean, I, well, I'm, I, as far as I know, I didn't provoke him. And uh, the next thing, and I'm thinking, I'm just thinking to myself, I'm going to have to just leg it here in a minute. <laughs> and uh, next thing, I've just felt this big arm around my shoulders. And uh, it's Richie Hull. And you know how big Richie is. He's a big lad. Mm. And, uh, he, and then I've seen Dean lean and have a word in this kid's ear. I don't know what he said to him, but this kid soon went. <laughs> <laughs> So, yeah, Dean and Richie definitely saved my life that night, I think. Oh, anyway. bless him. Um, yeah, it was uh, it was funny. Uh, and then, so, where were we? Why take it? Yeah, and, and that week, it was a great learning curve because every night we're in the bar with these lads picking the brains. And, you know, Andy Gold, I got to know him down there quite well. Mm. Um, become good mates with him. Um, and on the Thursday of that week, I won, I won the lake. And this is going to sound a bit soppy, and I probably shouldn't say this, but I will. I remember, like, after everyone had gone, I got really emotional, like, crying on the bank. Yeah, yeah. Because I'd won the match in that, in that field. And uh, Where um, were you? What lake were you? Trelawney, peg 16 I was on. Right. Um, oh, I'm sorry, 17. I could reach across, and I caught a cross on hard pellets, and then I caught, oh, was it? No, sorry. Might have been meat back then or corn. And I caught down the edge on corn. That's how I won it, basically. And only only a low weight, 70 odd pound it was. Yeah. Um, but if you won a match on a Thursday, and it was a Thursday, I believe, uh, you won a holiday. You won a free entry to a, the Winners Week Festival. Um, so I won that for the following year. And I, I just remember ringing my mum and saying, I won it. I really, you know, I was so happy just to mm. have competed in that environment at that, you know, at that level sort of thing. Because again, that was still when I'm fairly fresh in my club fishing. I think we'd been going together for that year, but only for a few months. Yeah, um, yeah. And uh, and and so that was my love affair with White Acres, which went and went and went until about we stopped going about three years ago, didn't we? Yeah. Um, Do you think um, you think that commercial fishing was different then to how it is now? Obviously, you, you said this year you've really focused on commercials massively. How different is it, and what's different about it now? Because it's not that long ago that we were going to White Acres and you were fishing commercials, festivals, Western Pools, Monk Hall, all the festivals that you still hear about now, you used to go and fish regularly. 
uh, coming into commercial fishing very seriously this year, what's the difference now to then? I think what we've seen is um, the standards improve massively for a start. Like, I used to feel you could easily do everything and compete. And I think a lot of anglers felt the same. I mean, if you look, you know, look at Lee Kerry, for example. You know, Lee Kerry used to do White Acres festivals, do his commercial fishing. Then he'd do his natural fishing as well. Now he focuses pretty much exclusively on his team fishing and his feeder fishing. Mm -hmm. And the same can be said for Steve Ringer. You know, he used to go down there, compete. We've won about 12 festivals, any Steve? Probably or, uh, more than anyone, yeah. Yeah. Um, Des might have won more, but that yeah. would be it. Um, you know, and, and, and everyone used to do it, didn't they? And I don't know. I don't know whether whether because it was like one-off events down there and you go down and um, we're all in the same boat sort of thing and Porth was in, so that was a natural venue element to it as well. So it was a mixed thing. Um, but it had this feeling of you could definitely turn up and compete. If you if you got it right down there, you'd have a good week and you mm. win some money and you do really well. Uh, and then I think you've had a, a pod of anglers come through who've just taken it to the next level. Jamie, Andy Bennett, Jamie Hughes. Yeah, yeah, Jamie Hughes, Andy Bennett, Christian Jones. Now, you know, last, I'd said that, <laughs> wouldn't have said that 12 months ago. I mean, he's always, he's been brilliant for the last few years, but he's really risen to that level, hasn't mm. he, this, this last few months. Jordan Holloway's getting there, you know, on his results. Um, there's, there's a group of them, isn't there, who've, and I think, you know, just fishing with them, filming with them, talking to them, you can see that they're so in touch with it. And that's only because they're 100% focused on it. And, you, you can't compete with that unless mm. you go and do it a lot. Mm. And, that, and that's that's what's made me want this year to really focus on it. What what were quite formative for me, Matt, I filmed uh, a series with Christian called, we've got a little idea for a project called Match Winning Edges. And uh, I'd not been doing a great deal of commercial fishing that year when I filmed that. I think we'd done our usual thing. We'd been, I'd done the Lindome Festival in May, and I think I did, did quite well, but I was only really seeing one venue mm. at Lindome, which I know anyway. Um, but I went out with Christian a few times, a few different places, and I'm like, gosh, this is different to how I remember it. Like, this is, this, I wouldn't have done that. Mm. And he's winning, you know, he's, he's winning loads at this point. And uh, that was so good. And Christian, like, he's helped me massively with my fishing over the last couple of years commercial wise because he's such an open book he'll tell you everything and anything he's doing in terms of giving you information about the fishing itself yes exactly that and uh and he did you know he shared all this thing this stuff with me and i'm like god this is diff so different to how i remember mm. so give, give us a few examples like what are the give i mean you don't have to tell us any secrets i'll tell you anything or you do have to tell us some secrets <laughs> should i say christian will tell you if i did anyway. yeah but give me a few examples of what you know things that them names are doing that you've mentioned yeah. that are different, that put them at the top every time, that right. you know have raised them to that next level? A couple of things. You know, first of all, overshotted rigs, fishing the, you know, um, overshotted pole rigs. Yeah. And the technique that's required. I covered the pole masters this year, walking around. You could mm. see there were only a few, ever a few people going to win that festival because there were only ever a few people who knew how to do that right. And you could see the importance of being able to get your rig into the cover and then it's a way of working the rig when it's in there. And there's plenty of videos about it that are out there. But if you haven't got that in your bag, you are at a serious disadvantage. And I can tell you, watching the pole masters, 10% of them at the most had it, had it mm. right. You know, and, it, and, and it's a way of catching F1s undercover. I mean, how else can you actually get a rig under a reed bed? You can't. That's the only way. Mm. And that's one example. And until you've seen it, you don't know, do you? Mm. And, and the problem is, of course, which is my own fault again, but because I'd won a few things on commercials. I got to a good level at that kind of fishing. I was perhaps a bit dismissive. and perhaps mm. thinking, oh, well, yeah. Oh, he might have caught on an overshot rig, but I'd have caught a load fishing shallow normally. I've, I've won plenty of matches with F1 shallow. I know how to do that. And it's that attitude which we get into, isn't it? You know, mm. it's that way of thinking that we get into. Um, but yeah, went and, 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 and that, that's one example. Pellet, hard pellet fishing, another example. You know, there's lots of tiny things that like so Jamie Hughes does that put him at an advantage, tiny strung out rigs with back shot in the correct place to make sure that presentation's perfect. Hook pellets that are treated in a certain way or a certain kind of pellets or pale coarse pellets or red pellets or tiny things, Matt. But it's not, you know, gone are the days when it's the difference between catching 80 pound and 90 pound that. That can be the difference now between catching 20 pound and 
80 pound mm. these little edges are seem more important than ever as well mm. um so that you know that's that's a couple that spring to mind straight away really Mar nice to hear margin fishing another one um i've sort of messed about with margins and I, i'm a bit of a ligger i am and i've always sort of fished generally a six inch hook length because i always think well you're down the edge you're fishing a big bait get a little line on the bottom biggish hook so your you bait's stable on the bottom. That's got to be better, right? Mm -hmm. Oh, my God. Like, change to a four-inch hook length for down the edge. Like a flicking a switch. Everyone's in the mouth. The bites are like that. And it's like all these tiny things that, again, perhaps I thought, Tom, well, bloody hell, I'm a good commercial angler. I have one quite a lot on commercials. I'm, I know what I'm doing. No, you don't. Not mm -hmm. until, not not really. Not, mm. I think, I'm, I probably sound like I'm, I don't know how to, how to put it other than the difference between between being a good commercial angler and the next level up. That's like that's what I'm trying to work mm, out at the minute. Mm. And it's hard, but it's really enjoyable and rewarding. Mm, very interesting. Very interesting. I like the fact that they're so good. Mm. That is professional. That is next level. That's what I want fishing to be personally. And listening to that, so, so interesting. i tell you what bloke blew me away as well with it. it um, you know, winter silvers. Now... I fancy myself at that game. I think I'm good at that. If I had to pick a strength, skimmers and roach on the pole, I'd, yeah. yeah. Give anybody a run for the money at that, I would have said. And then you go down to Medlands and Jamie Hughes takes it clean out, fishing pellets long. Andy Bennett on the yeah. festival down there. Won both matches. Won both matches. Unbelievable mm -hmm. levels of consistency on a kind of fishing that you wouldn't, you know, and, and with all due respect, I would have said, if you'd have asked me before, this year, I'd have said, put Jamie next to Matt. Matt will take him clean yeah, every yeah, yeah. time. I would have. That's what I'd have said. But Jamie took you clean out. I know, yeah. you're obviously, you're on different, different pegs. Different pegs, but... Yeah. But, and, and Bennett did as well, though. You know, it wasn't like a... It wasn't an international who won that match. I would have expected it to be. Top I'll, two, Jamie Hughes, Andy Bennett. Yeah. Yeah. And that's silverfish fishing. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, I and Christian won the silverfish festival at Bradshaw's, didn't mm -hmm. he? And... and uh, Coming to Allcroft the year before him and Kieran and did really well in our festival. And do you think great. they'll ever go into natural fishing, then no. guys? I don't know. I mean, the problem is, of course, it's it's almost that Achilles heel, isn't it? I think that's the Achilles heel you've got and I've got maybe in the past. Is our biggest weakness is also our biggest strength. We try and do everything. Mm. I've always wanted to be an all-round angler, but what it says is you can't do that because by focusing on these commercial methods and tactics, you can take them to a level above and beyond everybody else and win more as a cost of it. So if Jamie Hughes came river fishing, would his commercial fishing suffer? Definitely, yes. 100%. He can't do everything. Mm. Mm. What do you think about um, the very best in the games nowadays? They seem to definitely be segmented. You mentioned it earlier, Steve Ringer, Lee Kerry, doing an awful lot of feeder fishing used to do a little bit of everything. Um, them commercial boys pretty much stick to commercial carp fishing in summer, do some winter silverfish fishing in winter. But the combination of all of these really top anglers coming and fishing against each other seems to be happening less and less at the minute. Yeah, uh, it does. And it saddens me, to be honest. Mm. Um, yeah, I mean, it's almost a separate podcast to talk about th this... And the effect this has on the sport you know we want if we want a professional sport which allegedly we do mm. if you asked all them anglers so would you like match fishing to be a professional sport they'd say yes then we cannot continue to fragment our talent pool across so many different disciplines mm -hmm. like to me it's it's just silly it's like why would all the best all choose to do different things it's almost like we're all match fishing's just spread out over everything hasn't it um and the angling trust have done nothing to show leadership or direction. I'm not saying they necessarily should, but if you've got the right events for anglers to fish that pull them together, then I don't think that would happen. What do you think would be a good event for that? What could you do? What could you do that would bring an appeal to, say, get Steve Ringer, Lee Kerry, fishing against Andy Bennett, Jamie Hughes regularly? It's a good question. I think it's doable. I think it's not necessarily money either that should be at... Mm. the thing you know maybe it is money money would help but um prestige you know 
I, I'd love to see, and I've talked about it to you for years, I'd love to see a qualification system to fish for England, mm. even if it's only in the European Championships, but like something whereby, you know, all the anglers come together, right, there's four qualifiers, one on Larford or wherever, you know, pick four venues that mm. are four different styles of fishing, so it's a bit of a, or four things that suit the venue you're going to, whatever you want to do, and and just try and focus everybody's attention. Like, sorry, controversial rant coming up, so I apologise to everybody. <laughs> might, might, I'm now that. No apology needed. But what the hell's going off with, like, top flight match fishing now? We have got a feeder team, a commercial <laughs> feeder team, an under 15s, an under 20s, an under 25s, a men's, a ladies, a disabled, a veterans, uh, older veterans, masters, well, masters, a masters feeder. The, I'm sorry, and this is a, sorry, you might have to bleep this out, but the prestige from fishing for England will be gone soon if they carry on like that. And there's no leadership from the Angling Trust, is there? I think that it's been ridiculously diluted when you look at all that. How do you define the best when it's so fragmented like that? Um, How do you define who the best is? Well, we know, if we're honest, that it ain't the best, is it, anymore? No. At all. It's not. You know, you, you there's people in those England teams who are, at best, open match level, and they're there because they can be, because they can afford to be. And, yeah, it's... I, what do you think? I think I think it stands the danger of being damaging to match fishing's chances of being taken seriously as a professional sport. Mm, mm. I agree. No, I agree massively. There's nothing stopping... I mean, there's certain people, I'm saying, that you just mentioned all them different teams there. There are anglers who could fish in pretty much every one of them categories that you just said. Mm. So there's probably anglers out there who could fish in the vets, who could fish in the feeder team, who could fish in the float team, who could fish in the yeah. what, whatever, the yeah. the commercial feeder team and be really, really good at all of it. Yes. So, yeah, yes. it's, a, it's a difficult one. It's very, very spread out. It, it's fragmented and it, it's, it will be damaging, you mm. know, because if you take, you know, you work with young people a lot, Matt, um, and what you do, by the way, is, is in, amazing with the under 15s. You know, I think the fact that you and Denty take so much time out and grew back it, you know, is it's commendable. Um, but where do these kids aspire to be? What should, you know, when they're sat there, like it was dead easy for me. I could only look, read Match Fishing Magazine and mm. I could only read Will Rays and Darren Cox, these anglers. I wanted to be them and they did a bit of everything. And that was my dream. And, and I was able to go and do that. These kids nowadays, it's like I'm sounding old, aren't I? These kids nowadays. <laughs> <laughs> Sounded like Alan Scott all <laughs> then. Um, you know, what do they want to be? Well, mm. I think, to be honest, they'll want to be Jamie Hughes, probably more than... Uh, Will Raisin. Yeah, mm. because I think there's a clearer direction goal to get there. Mm. It's definitely more accessible as well. I mean, me and Steve had this chat in our um, little topical podcast. Mm. It's definitely easier to go and do commercial fishing than it is international fishing. And it's clean, isn't it? It's a nice, clean route to success. Whereas you look at, as I said, the fragmentation of the international setup. I just love to see it unified, me. I just love to see one league for match fishing. Like mm. one thing, it's probably a bit nostalgic and a bit irrelevant to my view now, to be honest. But like, I just look at the state of it and think, God, like, what? why can't we go back to them days when there was one or two events for everybody mm. to fish and we were all... Even the big finals are very fragmented in the self now. Mm. Numerous... Big feeder finals, numerous big commercial finals. Yeah. I can see it coming in just in the winter. Uh, and it's great that there's so many things to fish. I'm not saying that's a negative at all. Um, no. But it is definitely, I think the more there is, the less prestige there is. Oh, within totally. A, totally. You know. It bothers me. It mm. really does. Do you think that there'll be a cycle where it comes back around? I do, uh, yeah. And, I do. You know, it, it catches up with itself because it wasn't always like this and now it seems to be. And I think so, mate. Yeah, I think there needs to be at the end of the day um, because, you know, we've gone qualifier crazy. There's no doubt about that. And, and you know, the events that Gary and I run are as, as guilty of it as anybody mm. else. So I'm not, I'm not knocking it. Um, but, you know, everything's now qualifiers, isn't it? And really, 
The problem with qualifiers is, it's like buying a lottery ticket in some respects. Even if you're brilliant, like Jamie Hughes, right? He still knows he has to go on 10 qualifiers to qualify. And he'll do it for everyone until he does. And he's, he's in all three and that's happy days, isn't yeah. it? But um, He'll probably win one of them because he's incredibly good at fishing. Absolutely. But he still had to go through the process. Yes. Of wasted time, wasted journey. Driving home dejected because he's drawn a peg he's had no chance of doing any good off. Whereas the beauty of team fishing and the thing I love, and we talk about, um, you know, Thorn and those days when it were leagues and team fishing and that, is, yeah, you know, you might catch seven pound twelve and beat three anglers around you, but that's brilliant from where you be. And Matt Godfrey's driving home really happy because he knows he's done the best he could from his peg, mm -hmm. and and on qualifiers that gone. So as a, as a sport, as a game. It's not the best format, really, is it? Because only one person in each zone, or one person on the match in some cases, goes home happy. Mm, mm. Whereas team fishing, you all go... So I'd love to see team fishing come more to the fore again. Um, again, well, that's one we're going to talk about on a separate podcast, isn't it? But I'd love to see team fishing or different styles of fishing that reward consistency mm. and reward getting and, and encourage you to get the best from your peg come mm. back to the fore of, of modern match fishing. Mm. I suppose that's fishing though, mate. Like uh, everyone says it, you know, it's it's not quite got professional properly like a darts or a snooker has. And, and it's just that fact that you go like this in match fishing and it does not matter how good you are. If you go like that and that's a bad peg and it's a really bad peg, doesn't matter if you are the best there has ever been, you you can't display your skills and be the best from that area. No, I think I, I don't agree in that. You know, I've seen um, you do some fantastic things. Probably more impressive when you get a result from a crap peg, but it's in a team match. It matters, doesn't it? So, yes. So all of a sudden, you've come six out of ten. Yeah, you've come six out of ten, but. From that peg, either side of his head, next to nothing. Yeah, yeah, ninety percent of people would be last from that yeah, peg. Yeah, you've, yes. you've come six out of ten. Now that to me, a is brilliant for the sport because you, you know you, you're a hero, aren't you? Mm. Of, on a qualifier, just forget it. Yeah, that's what I mean. Mm. Mm. It sort of removes that being good at fishing side of it yeah, sometimes. It does. It does. So I really hope. And you know what, mate? We've just sat here and reminisced, haven't we, about why? Because you now how it used to be brilliant and. I'm 36 now, so I've been match fishing for 20 years, and it's changed almost immeasurably in that time. Mm. So, of course, we'd be daft to think that in 20 years it's going to be the same as it is now. It's, when quite, it's quite exciting, isn't it, yeah. to, to think what it is going to be like. What do you predict is going to happen in it? Like, what do you think might happen in it? Gosh, you know, mate, I, I really don't know. I'd love to see the Angling Trust show some leadership. I'd love to see a match angler at the top of angling trust and i'm not volunteering at all because i would not want the job myself <laughs> no. but you know they've got a hard job there's yeah. no denying they have got a ridiculously hard job they have but i believe with the figures that we've got with the uptake we've got in fishing and with the new blood we've got coming into fishing you know there is a and the proven benefits of fishing there's a real positive case to take to some high profile sponsors mm. but to do that they're going to have to take control of the situation and, and show something measurable and provable to those sponsors mm. and say, look, you know, um, to the trade, get behind us trade and, and build a professional arena, which mm. we ain't got. And it can't really be driven by money either. It needs to be driven by sort of a more holistic approach to match to fishing. It's a game at the end of the day, isn't it? Mm. Mm. And it's I'll tell you another thing, Matt, which again is a separate podcast, but it's an expensive game, isn't it? More than ever. Very, very difficult. For your average man. Mm, mm. But on all different scales, whether it's the international side of things or just going on big commercial events. Mm, mm. Especially with everything at the minute getting more and more expensive. But you create the prestige. You create the hero. You create the game right. And everything else will follow, I believe. Mm. Like, at the minute, with too much, too many things that people aspire to or not even really aspire to, just... As I said, that, that with the international teams is an example of it. Mm. Uh, Pulling it all back in then, mate, and going back to a question that I sort of touched on earlier, um, you said that your 
mission aim sort of thing was to become this all round angler, someone who could do a little bit of everything. Where where are you at on that journey at the minute, would you say? Because you speak as if you're quite old, and I know you're cracking on a bit, but you're not that old. Thirty six. Yeah. Um I feel like I've won some nice things in my life. I'm quite proud of my record, but I've got a long way to go. And like I said, being realistic, you know, this year going back to commercial fishing and, and focusing quite intensely on that. Um, I've had a bit of luck. I drew a good peg in the commercial national this year, won that. So that's a nice one on the CV. But truthfully, I'm way off where I want to be in terms of, you know, I wouldn't say I'm in the top 30 commercial anglers in the country at the minute. You know, there's some brilliant anglers out there who've put a lot into it. And the other thing, Matt, joking about the age thing, is how many good young uns there are coming through. Mm, like, you know, mm. um, Charlie Law, you know, just got and smashed the fish out of the park, qualified, and then he would have qualified again because he won the Junior National, you know. Um, Brad Lucas, brilliant. Tyler Bird, who I've been travelling with, you know, he's a cracking young angler. Mm. Um, and uh, so in that sphere, I, I think I'm still quite a way off where I want to be. And and that's brilliant because it gives you something to work at and, and get to. Obviously, I'm focusing on that at the expense of the other disciplines because, as I said, I'm trying to hone my skills in that area and just see where I can get to. Mm. Um, Are you missing the natural element of it while you're doing that kind of fishing? Massively. Because like, I know you love going and running a stick float down on a river and catching some roach and fishing with the Lincoln lads on the trend and... Like, how much of that is going to still play a part oh, in mate, I'm, massive, I'm, I'm missing it massively. Mm. The most enjoyable matches for me last year were on the Trent. Like, I mean, we had the Division 1 on there. Obviously, I was lucky enough to qualify for Riverfest on there, and I just had a lovely summer. I mean, but Jordan and I just went um, pleasure fishing before the final last year. And we just had four days at Burton Joyce, and we just fished, like, hemp and maggots and caught great big roach every chuck. It mm. was just, just a real paradise on the doorstep. So... Um, missing it massively. Uh, you know, I'd like to go back to it and have a good go at it. I'm hoping that, obviously, end of September, there's not much to fish anymore on commercials. I, most of your big summer finals are over, so I've got a couple of months there where I can dip my toe in. I'm sure I'll have a bit of the same problem I've had on commercials, though, because I've been doing that all summer. I'll be mm, starting mm. at the bottom again and working my way up. Um, I'm just going to see how this year goes. And if I don't qualify for a big final this year, and let's be honest, time's running out, um, I will definitely have another go next year and, and commit to it again for this summer period. In between, we've got loads of fishing that I love, commercial silverfish fishing, which is, you know, it's not natural venue fishing, but it's not far off, is it? It's as enjoyable because mm. you're fishing for bites, aren't you? Um, I, the way I'm feeling at the moment, I've got unfinished business on the commercials. I would like to win. Fishermania, maybe match this or Golden Reel. And I think if I put my mind to it, I can do that in the next few years. Mm. Um, once I've done that, then I'll probably have a go at Riverfest, something like that. Um, but I, I do feel that, you know, you've got to be quite single minded. I mean, that was how I won the Drenning Knockout Cup, if you remember. I used to literally chase it and go practicing before every round and. If you get out what you put in, don't you? Simple as that, really. I think you, I mean, you're probably not blowing your own trumpet enough, but I think that winning that event in particular is quite a satisfactory and self-actualizing um, answer to what you wanted to be, an all-round angler. That's, for, in my eyes, and I'm sure, especially back at the time then, that was the competition to win if you wanted to be crowned the all-round yeah, it was. Angler. It was, and I was lucky to win it at a time, you know, when it was still quite a current thing to win. And I was, I was over the moon. Mm. I remember, I, you, you. I tell you what, um, we haven't talked about this much, but I remember that day. You're obviously my bank runner. You helped me out loads. But what a week we had that week. You won the Preston Festival at White because didn't you? So, yeah, you were uh, a right adventure, weren't yeah. you? Yeah. Then we come back to Docklow and. Uh, I think you were more nervous than me, weren't you, in that final? Because you'd been. Uh, it helping. was close. It was great, wasn't it? It was very close. Yeah, yeah, it was uh, it was really, really cl closer than I realised, I think, mm. at the time. Um, I knew he were catching well, Matt Derry, on the next peg, and I thought, but, um, you know, you, you helped me loads. That good bank running, pal. You kept me, kept me in front, kept, kept my nose far. in front. I, I, I tell you what I loved about watching you in that final. That competition was all about um, being an all-round angler, and obviously you'd fish qualifiers on canals, on rivers, on commercials, on 
different venues doing different styles of fishing to actually get to the final in the first place. Mm. But even in that final, because of the kind of venue Docklow was, you had to do a lot of different things. You fish for some F1s, you fish for some carp, and you caught some silverfish as well. Yeah. It were the perfect final to crown a, an angler that could do a lot of different things. Yeah, yeah. It, it was, you know, I was over the moon. I can well, remember how. Mm. And and what I wanted to do like, since then is sort of follow it up with some success on a variety of venues just to prove to myself. Uh, this is all this is about at the end of the day, isn't it? It's about proving stuff to yourself. Mm. Like, I feel anyway. I mean, I'm realistic. I'm never going to be Matt Godfrey because I'm just not dexterous enough. I'm just not fast enough. I'm just not that man i'm just not natural ability isn't there for tom scroll never has been but by a lot of hard work i can get to a very good level and we all know what the drawbacks like in fishing mm. i can uh, i can beat matt godfrey off the next peg i've done it's plenty happened of times before yeah <laughs> so and we'll uh, not talk much about yeah, that we'll anyway that. Okay, so, so more on that i would say not that you not that you ever remind me of it if it does happen but, um, or vice versa. No, no, I'd, n- I'd never, I'd never, made, I'd never comment on it. What, when, what, 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 when, what, last time we went next to each other? I thought my personal scores? favourite was when I was at Hallcroft on, uh, on, on Reed Pool and you were next to me. And, yeah, uh, yeah. And I could catch the skimmers and you fished for the wrong fish, didn't you? Yeah. Some reason yes. you fished for roach. And I don't, I, I don't need to tell you, Matt, that roach are much smaller than skimmers. <laughs> <laughs> well, that the day I mix your ground bait for you. Um, well, not get, get drawn into the <laughs> technicalities of exactly what happened on that day. No, um, seriously, it, it is that for me. It's about, I, I like the fact that I can prove to myself I can do things. So yeah. like when I won that knockout cup, that was a big confidence boost. Since then, I've managed to win events on rivers, canals and commercials. I'd like now to win a big commercial final, just to say I've done it. I hope you do it. I bet you do. You get about half the money. Yeah, fantastic. <laughs> I, hope the, I hope you win the biggest one. Um, I'll have a good go. Good, good. One one other little thing just to touch on. You talk about not being dexterous or, or your channel. Like We've spoke about it a lot on the podcast with different guests, hmm. um, that some people are dead natural and some people aren't dead natural. What? How, how do you know that you're a certain kind of person and then you, you've got this ability to obviously apply yourself to go look i'm not that dexterous i'm not that so i need to channel mm. my fishing in this way or i need to plan my fishing in this way how, how do you realize you're not that sort of person and how do you then apply your fishing to get the better results well i realized fairly early i mean basically at school I, i've always been up for anything you said it earlier i'm quite positive and i'll go for it sort of thing and there'd be about 13 in, or 12, I don't know how many in a cricket team, but say there was 11 in a cricket team mm. and there were 12 went for it, there'd be me left. Or when they're picking the team at football, you know, like when there's two captains and they pick one and then the other. And yeah. Luckily, I was never quite last because I got a mate who tended, was quite good and he'd always pick me, Liam. So I'd always be like, but he'd never pick me first, even though I'm my best mate. He'd wait till about the eighth just so he didn't embarrass me. He'd pull me in. Right. But I should have been last on ability. <laughs> And, uh, yeah, I, I used to like, I was the one who, you know, when it was uh, sports day, mm. I was always like egg and spoon race. That's all I'd get picked for to represent my little branch of the school. You know, that that was about it. But, uh, <laughs> so, uh, no, you know, look, I'm not I'm not being self-deprecating. I just, mm. just know I'm not that good at physical things. Never mm. have been. Um, but the beauty of fishing, of course, you can train yourself to be. Mm. And, and, and I can do things very well. Like I was... I'd have gone the wire last winter, were quite funny. Um, if ever you have Rory Jones on the podcast, which you should, by the way, ask him about taking me bleak fishing last last winter. We'll have to get him on, Rory. He'd do a great podcast. He'd do a fantastic one. But he sat me down and he said, right, come on, let's have a go at this bleak. And then and you can imagine. So we're having to like flick the... So I've, caught, I've caught plenty of bleak in the past, but it's never been like a speed challenge like it is on there. So there's bleak flying everywhere, maggots flying everywhere, hemp flying everywhere, and it's hemp flying in the keep net, bleak flying back in the water, <laughs> a whip tangling up. But he got me going and he got me quite and, and I fished two matches. The first day I had to do it, uh, I had twenty nine pound and Matt Derry won the section with no he didn't, sorry. It was Joe Holloway who won the section with mm. thirty pounds. So I was only a few ounces behind the winner of the section because I'd practiced and trained and got good at it with the right help. And the second day, I think I won my little section with 24, 25 pound of them. And I was really happy with it because I thought, yeah, I've, I've got to a level that's all right and I can improve more. And that's probably the most technically, dif- technically difficult style of fishing for me in that sense. So, you know, put your mind to it. I'll get there. But you know yourself. You go on a world champs. 
you know, you've not only got to be good at the bleak fishing, you've got to be good at the slider fishing, the whatever else you do uh, on that day. And for me, each one of those would take extensive practice that week just to get, it's almost like I forget things, Matt. Mm. Like, you know, when I chuck a method feeder, I can't just pick it up and chuck it under the far bank like most people can. I have to have like four or five chucks when I'll go in the tree and then it'll go eight meters off. And then eventually, it'll third or fourth chuck it mm. might go where I want it. And then I'm sound then, I'm all right then, I can do it. But it's just not easy, mm. it's not natural. Um, and uh, yeah, that that's how I, I feel about it. And I know that now and, and uh, by working in a certain way, I can still compete at the top level. So I'm not bothered. It's just realistically, mm. you know, you, you you have to manage what you dealt in life, don't you? The cards you dealt. Mm. I think it's interesting, though, that you learn how to apply yourself and you're really, really successful in it. And I think it's quite, um, it's very good to understand how you work as a person yourself in fishing because pretty much anyone can do anything if they just learn Right, that's what I need to do to be good at this Yeah, sort of thing. And I think it's really, I, I want to encourage anyone who wants to have a go at winning some of the competitions we've spoke about just today on the podcast previously, I think it's really important for, for everyone out there in fishing that if they fancy having a pop at it, it's not always going to be easy at all. In fact, it's probably going to be really difficult, but probably anyone could pretty much do anything applied in the right way a hundred percent and i think there's two things with it that i'd say that have, i've learned over the years that have helped me um obviously i've i've, I've probably said in the past few minutes sounds self quite sounds quite self-deprecating but it's not meant to because i know like that's one aspect of mm. of, of my character and self-awareness the other one is, I know I can win. So once you've got that in your mind, that yes, you can. And, and if I can, because I am a right cack-handed devil, anybody, believe me, anybody can, right? So what you need is a positive mental attitude on the day, on the session. Like, I regard you, not blowing smoke up your ass. I regard you as the best angler in the country, right? But I've bashed you up quite a few times next Loads of times. And a few times out of them, not all the time, but a few times, it's not been the fact that you that I've been on a better peg. I've done it better than you and beat you. 100%. And and that's, so like that, I've managed to do that against the best. Anybody can do that. And that's the beauty of fishing. If you get it right on the day, if you get your tactics right, your feeding right, everything right, take the right risks, gamble a bit if you want to. You can't, but you've got to have a, a really positive. And when you're on the bank, you've got to be quite ruthless and think, I don't care I'm next to Matt Godfrey. He's going down today. I don't care I'm next to Alan Scarthorne. He's, I'm I'll take him, him, him out. And I've took him, I've took him all out over the years near enough. It happens. It's easy if you're on a minute and you do it right and you get your plan right, your tactics right. Um, so so you've got to have a, com a certain confidence and aggression and positivity in your fishing, haven't you? Mm, mm. Um, the other thing that I hear a lot, and I know I'm wrong, I've fallen into the trap myself, but you and I were actually talking about it this morning in a different context. But there's a lot of bad match fishing theories out there that people get drawn into. Mm. For example, I've heard people say something like, well, Matt Godfrey's brilliant at bloodworm fishing, so I'm not going to fish bloodworm next to him because he'll wipe the floor of me at bloodworm, so I'm going to sit on casters all day and hope for three bream. Hold on a minute. If the roach are in front of you and not in front of Matt, which they could well be, Quite or more roach in front of you, you'll beat him on bloodworm. And who's to say that certain people have got it right every time? Absolutely. So, so you know, there's, there's all this... Sit next to Lee Curry feeder fishing, you could do it very similar, but th still beat them or... I think feeder fishing even more. Yeah, mm. yeah, even more plays into the hands of random events happening in your favour. And there's so many of them in fishing. So many of them, isn't there? It's like the drawback's important, yeah, massively important, but also it's how the fish feed. It's whether you're in the right depth of water. It's whether you get it right on the day. You know, and if you suss something an hour quicker than somebody else, all of a sudden they're on the back foot and you're winning. Mm. And, and mm. like, that's a real beauty of this match fishing game, isn't it? It, mm. it is a game and it's like, there's all sorts of things, random things that happen. And so that's one theory I'd avoid, the not fishing a method because you're next to a better angler. That's really damaging to your results. Um, and the other one, and I think we spoke about it earlier, is a dismissal of the most important part of fishing, which is getting bites. Like no end of people risk it from the start, don't they? Like I think we were talking about um, small fish fishing, for example. You know, a lot of people think, well, I'm going to need bream to win today, so they'll just set up one rod. Well, 
why not fish for the roach and have a line for the roach and you might just win with roach and then chuck for a bream and you can manage your swims, then you can leave your bream line and come back onto your roach line. And I'm talking very simplistically, but it's just to get the point across, isn't it, mm. about how how you should never you should never rule options out too quickly. The best mm. match anglers have these options open all the time and that's what I try and do and it's helped me so much to, mm. you know, and, it, and it's thanks to yourself, Rob Perkins, who taught me early on and... Anglers like Christian and Jordan more recently who I've been fishing with a lot and who've been helping me. And if you know what these options are, have them in the armory and do them, all of a sudden you you can just surprise yourself and, and all, before you know it, you've won something massive. Yes. Um, you know. It, great for great for people to hear that though. A million percent. Because so many... I had someone out in a sandwich shop the other week mm. and bloke, I, I, yeah, I go fishing. I've got my guru top on. I've got some guru bits of us. What, what kind of fish is oh, I just fish. Such and such. He says, I keep thinking about, you know, going in maybe the UK champs or a bigger... And I'm like, go and do it. Mm -hmm. Go and have a go. Like, definitely, I want as many people as possible to go and try and do it. Yeah. Yeah. It, it's... um. Absolutely, mate, and and it's the beauty of it is as well. Like, and, and I know we touched on it at the beginning of the podcast, didn't we? About the people in, in the sport who, when I was not in my hour of need, but when I was setting up on my own and I needed some help, there were people there who supported me and helped me. And mm. match fishing's a lovely hobby. Like mm. the people in it are fantastic. Like, most people on the bank who you talk to are match anglers would rather help you out, help you catch more fish, than work against you and you know stop you from catching fish. Yeah. It's a wonderful social hobby. And if you, even at the best level, the highest level, people want to help you. Mm. You know, like Jamie Hughes, so helpful with me this year. Like every opportunity he's got to have a chat with me and he knows what I'm trying to do. And he's been like, oh, try this, try this. You know. I honestly think, I know we talk about all the top commercial boys a lot. Yeah, Andy Bennett, Jamie Hughes, Christians. Mm. The, all of them people I find like that. Absolutely. So open and talk to you about it. And yeah. Yeah, I mean, Christian's f fantastic in that mm. way. He's probably the most open of anybody I've ever met. It, 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 as a top match angler, he's uniquely unsecretive, isn't he? Yeah. He's, um, yeah, perfect example, mate. And, and and that's it. So as you say, you know, people should feel empowered because this is one sport where, perhaps the only sport, I don't know, where you could sit next to the best and beat them and win the biggest prize of all. It's how yeah. it is. If that's not aspirational for people who are on the cusp of going and giving it a go, a go i don't know what will be so um what are you most proud of tom in what you've done fishing work everything we've talked about so far today um, that's a good question pal i like that one don't pal me pal don't pal me pal so we've talked about fishing wise winning wise the knockout cup we've touched on that work wise um i like to think i've helped a few brands through catch more and through my own involvement get a long way fuka Obviously, love working with them. Join and the I, revolution. I do feel a deep sense of uh, involvement, and I love working with David and Catherine still and seeing how that brand's growing and developing. You know, it's um, it's just been great. Mm. And, and you know, the nice thing, Matt, you know, it's, you get a bit of negativity, don't you, every now and then. And, and when we first launched, we had loads of negativity. But now all that's gone. You know, mm. we put stuff on now, and we don't get half the abuse that we used to get. Mm. And seeing how David's managed that, business and grown it and, and how Catherine's marketed it has been incredible so I'm very proud to be involved with them going forward and like Otbox for example you know I was working with Otbox when I worked for DHP back in 2013 2014 and Rick became a really good personal friend and we'd talk about things and I had a box and I helped him develop a few things with a box that have gone on to be featured in the latest models I've helped him um recruit some anglers who are now on the box and it's lovely to see that system evolve and that just think I've played probably quite a big part in helping it to, mm. to obviously very self-fulfilling that must be massively yeah um in terms of my work I mean there's a couple of things that stand out like one of them was actually an up box video if you, if you ask me the best video I've ever made work wise it'd be the one with Adrian Whittle on the Y I remember that one um that sat one. out in the water yeah that was it. It was uh, it was amazing, mate. One of them days that was just special, you know. Um, so so good, like them barbel feeding. Hadrian just put on a masterclass. Like, yeah, it was so so good. Um, 
That's the drone footage where you can see him flashing in it. That's you were the telling one. me about. That's yeah, I remember yeah. the film. I can remember the film. Yeah, if you Google Hadrian Whittle barbel fishing on the Y, it will come up. And uh, yeah, it was well, just, just a special day. And then I've I've done some written work that I'm quite proud of. I did a book earlier this year actually, um, worked with Roger Mortimer, who I used to work with at, at DHP, mm-hmm. um, the commercial match fishing handbook. If you have a look on the Catch More Media uh, Facebook page, there's details of how you can get hold of that if you want to buy one. Um, but that was you know. It was interesting to go back, actually, Matt, to our old game. The old, uh, you know, it's a book of zine, so it was mm. all copywriting. And Do you think there's still some value in the written word? Massive value. Massive value, yeah, I do. Even if it's in, you know, it, like the written word is, is still um, the core, isn't it, of what we do, really. If you think even on Facebook, it's about the right writing. And the, and, and somebody else, I want to mention her again, who's, who's helped me so much with that, has been... Catherine David Preston's wife, because she's... I, I personally love talking to Catherine, and David, but Catherine especially about the marketing. I mean, we went and had a bite to eat with him just this week. Yeah. Um, and I love listening to her. She's got this way of, like, she listens to everyone, and then she tells you something, and you just go, yeah, yeah, that's right. Um, listening, yeah, sort of active listening, isn't it? Is mm. the, and and the, both of them, like... I know you've had David on here, and I know he, he always makes out... Um, well, there is no doubt he's got um, issues with certain uh, things to do with autism and yeah, whatever yeah. else. But at the end of the day, I've never met a more active listener. And a, and, a, and if you genuinely, I've said this to him, if he didn't tell me he got them things, I probably wouldn't even know. But he's so good with people and so good at working things out and getting to the core of what mm. things need to be. It's, um, yeah, I love working with them too. Um, so, yeah, you know, I think the written word, uh, that's where we started with that, wasn't it? They've they've proved to me the last few years just how important it is still. Here's one for you. Well, sorry, I'm going to take you off on another tangent here, right? Go on then. Um, AI, artificial intelligence, right? Mm. People are using it now to write all sorts of things from Facebook posts to... to and quite a few of the fishing brands are now using it, I've found. Are they? Yes, yeah. How's that work then? So you basically... Give an idea of what you want to say. So you put your keywords in and they produce little blocks of text. There's been no whole novels written by AI, artificial intelligence. Now. That's mind-boggling, isn't it? Yes. Yeah. Uh, I've forgotten the name of the the um, website that is being used. So like... That's blown my kids mind. Kids in school are using it to, to write their homework and stuff like that. And you should put in, say... Oh, uh, that's making me edit. Put Battle of Hastings essay in and it will rattle you off what happened and, and yeah. all that. It's, or you uh, might put... Um, Guru uh, poll um, promotion or guru poll, and you give it an idea what it wants to do, and it will sc- scrolls the internet, searches the internet for all the articles about it, pulls out the relevant bits, mess- mixes them up, and gives you something back that's legible. So the question was going to be, wow, in a few years, our skill set, writing mm. about fishing making fishing films, talking about fishing, you know. It, it, what's, what made me ask it is on Radio 4, there was a, an author talking about the mm. dangers of it in their world, you know. Cause mm. Chat all, GP. Sorry, that's the website. That's I just it. found it. Yeah, Chat yeah, GP, yeah. yeah. You know, I wonder if I wonder if we'll be phased out and there'll be an automaton sat where you're sat in 10 years doing the podcast. I don't, well, there I are, don't know. There are other bits of software where they've had um ai generate like celebrity voices and stuff like that so yeah. they'll, they'll have um i've seen it but basically you know if ai you could say oh matt godfrey guru podcast host and it will do his voice yeah. and everything like that surely they can't get that personality across that an individual can though that unique surely i don't that, think so on the moment tom skull is suddenly talking about the issue he had with a banana once when his mum went out, or what? You know what I mean? Surely it's not that off the cuff. I hope not, and I don't think so. <laughs> <laughs> Do you know what I mean? We'll have to wait and see, won't yeah. we? Yeah. If, Matt's, if Matt's not here next episode, it's because we've got a robot to replace him. Yeah, yeah. That's it. yeah. <laughs> wow. It, it was just something that, that came to mind. You know, obviously we've talked about our careers, and mm. uh, yeah. Uh, I, Somebody said to me the other day, one of the fishing brands, or a couple of the fishing brands are using it for generating certain posts. And uh, Gary was telling me. Um, wow, I didn't know and that. And I said, uh, and he was like, do you think you think we could use it? I was no, no way. Nobody's ever <laughs> bloody replacing me. I'm not having it. <laughs> <laughs> amazing, amazing. Um, we always ask some quickfire questions mm. on the podcast. 
and I haven't even teed you up for these ones. Okay. Um, so I'm going to ask them, yeah. If there was an item in your seat box you couldn't live without, what would it be? Uh, shot, pl- shot pliers. For putting them on? Yeah, because I can't do it with my teeth because I'm useless. Really? Or anything like that. Yeah. Oh, well, one tooth comes out in front of other, so no ah, chance. Right, yeah. okay. All right. Um, if you could only fish one venue for the rest of your life, where would it be? Oh, that's a good one. One. You're going to want to say a few here. One. No, You're only no. having one. We'll take your first answer as well. River Trent. Oh, best Very venue nice. in the universe ever. Um, who is the best angler that you've ever fished with? Matt Godfrey. Ah, oh, that's nice, isn't I it? I know, I know. I know. <laughs> You'll pay me later. Okay, thanks, mate. Um, if there's one thing you could change about fishing, what would it be? Um, the fragmented nature of it, Ooh. as discussed earlier. Very nice, yeah, yeah. Like it. Um, and if you had to give someone who's never been fishing before some inspirational advice to go and give it a go, what would you say to them? Oh, God. That's caught me out, that one. What would I say to him? Mm. Um, just do it. You'll know straight away if you love it or hate it. That's what I'd say. Because I've uh, coached a few people who've been out on the first ever trip. And you can tell straight away. They'll either chuck out catch one and be like wow this is the best thing in the world we'll do it forever or they'll chuck out oh i've got one and that'll be it you'll know ah very interesting very interesting um and i, I kind of know the answer to this next question seven and a half inches is that how much over depth you fish yes the weekend? always right. always yeah okay eight inch up length seven mm. and a half inches over depth yes yeah right. okay <laughs> Fantastic. Um, have you brought a gift in for the podcast? Obviously, you're a big fan of the podcast, aren't you? I love you the really podcast. You really enjoy the podcast. I do. And I do. you know the format that you have to bring a gift in. I'm a bit in. concerned because I haven't seen, like, guests usually, we, we, they can't see it, but there's Packages. usually a bag, yeah, or, bag. Or, or, like, under the table. So yeah. we, we know, but I, I mm. haven't seen one. Well, and the, obviously, lots on the table. Yeah, there's really really these are just a few. Good guests have brought yeah. us these gifts Some in. Some great gifts. Absolutely. I, yeah. I mean, I'm looking at this array of gifts and... I'm pleased to say that mine does top them all. Yeah. Yeah. That's it, a bold claim. It is. Yeah, it is. It's a set of Preston Innovations Chiantis. Now, these are the, the floats that have caught me more fish over the years than anything else. They're discontinued. And the reason I've bought them is Matt is constantly, when he's around mine, nicking them <laughs> without telling me. I'm, I've got like a little purple box where I keep them. I know exactly in, where it is. And he nicks them every time. The dilemma is the tube with them in has gone missing somewhere, and I don't know where. Right. So you're going to have to get another tube and I, I'll bring it down. But you might know better than me where it's gone. What tube? Exactly, what tube. <laughs> so there is a tube of Chiantis. Yeah. So what are you going to give it? Where's the gift then? Where are the Chiantis? Yes, where's the gift? Yeah, he's not brought a gift out. Um, now that is a podcast. All right, so, all right. Well, so, so, so you are going to you are gonna give us some Chiantis as I'll, a gift? Yeah, yeah, I've got you some Chiantis. You know I've, I've got okay. you some Chiantis. So when I come round to your house next... You're not taking another set? No way. No, we are. <laughs> I want Chiantis on this table from the Tom Scully podcast. There is a set of Chiantis for the podcast for you, yes. Okay, and I'll get them, and I'll film you giving them me, and I'll bring them down. Another set? Yeah. Flipping it. Just... <laughs> Unbelievable. Fantastic. Um, that were that were lovely, mate. Really enjoyed that. Are you going to come back on and we'll have a natter about some more things in the future? Absolutely, mate. I've loved it. Thank you very much for having me. And I must say, you know, I've said before, but what you two are doing is is fantastic work with these. I really enjoy listening to them. I don't have a lot of time to to watch and listen to other fishing media because I work in it, and so I find it quite. Um, when I'm not doing it, I like to do something else. But your work is the exception. I just love listening to it and. Uh, Keep up the good work, that's all I can say. Thank you, Matt. Really appreciate that.